Welcome to Smodcast. I'm Kevin Smith. Okay, kids, Scott Mosier felled with some sort of bronchial infection in Dallas. Not here again. Doesn't matter. Got me a co-host, man. <laughs> um, you hear that? The dulcet tones of a lady voice. <laughs> now, when you normally hear a dulcet tones of a lady voice on a Smodco program, it's my wife bitching at me about fucking how I fucked up something and done something <laughs> wrong. I don't think we're going to have that today, man. We're going to have a little... Fucking Love Fest crossover, man. This is a podcast that begins at Smodcast, but then goes over and finishes on a very popular show that y'all should be listening to, and you probably already all are, called Girl on Guy. Yes. Give it up for today's co-host, which is so fucking rare. It's usually just a series of people I know and shit. <laughs> um, give it up for Aisha Tyler. Aisha. You're a girl that I never had. How... how like when that song was popular, how many times do you have to tell people that's not how my name is spelled? Oh no, it was not. I'm talking that. about the ABC the song. The ABC song, which had like an E and a, it had a bunch of. It was extra. I E S H I E. My people were good at phonetics. <laughs> I um no, I never. It was not that. It was right around. It was like um what else was like uh it takes two Rob Bass. It was like that era. So I did a lot of requesting my own. A lot of really like ill-considered requesting of my own song like play my shit you know that's not that's not cute it's never yeah, it lady is. no it's not I somebody just... had a fucking song called like kevin's Smith. <laughs> i would have it on a non-stop play constantly <laughs> someone needs to do that immediately one I'm, of your one of your listeners I'll, you know i don't like wait that. for people to do shit anymore <laughs> i just do it for myself so over the course of the next week i'll be composing kevin's me want me to do some he was a boy that never had give me background of like i met him at the playground <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep he, it innocent. He walked from his house in some beautiful house slippers. You, I looked at your podcast number recently, and you're creeping up on a hundred. You've been committed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're um. Uh, Do this. Put your mic up. Like, like this. this. It's. I'm not. I'm not. I didn't put the right end into my mouth. Out, girl, is, the girl on guy host is like point this fucking phallic complaint. thing directly well, you have a totally at my different, face. We have our mics look the same, but I have like a sure uh, fuzzy. The, yeah, they're, they're just you just put talking to the talking to the business end, but yours Real, is like oh, a pointer. side. Yeah, yours Mine is like a side old side job. It does. It's adorable. It's more of a design thing. There we go. I sound so much better. Yours. Um, mine just is tough and I can take it anywhere. It's like the mic that you can drop on stage as a comic and it still functions. That's the mic I have. I do. You, I've did that once at a show and I felt so bad. I'm not a comic, but I was on stage answering a question and I tell, told a story and it's about it for dramatic effect. I dropped the microphone. I forgot to tell the sound people I was going to do it. <laughs> oh, wow. After the show. Cause there's a dude wearing headphones oh, monitoring yeah. everything because we were shooting it. oh okay and that dude got blasted and oh felt so no bad. I was like, doug i'm so fucking sorry wow sorry doug yeah i drop a, i drop i drop a mic like just to show the club i don't give a shit about their equipment really I'm like look yeah so i'm, gonna, I'm taking this mic like, with me you're gonna need a new one when I, you'll never forget me too late i blew it up kind yeah of thing. exactly everyone just follow that bitches let's go back to the your podcast so you're, you're creeping up on 100 100 you're, yeah you're committed in a way that most cats aren't like what well, most once most cats get a job in real media or grown up media, <laughs> they don't you know feel the need to kind of slum around in the podcast. World. I yelled at somebody today, actually, who shall be very nameless. I said, I don't need to make this fucking show. I make it because I love it. <laughs> I literally said that to somebody. And then I was embarrassed at the tone I took. But I was. I was like, I make it because I love it. I'm up at four in the fucking morning putting this thing together. I don't make any money from it. It's a total money hole. Right. I make it because I love it. It's you. you. Know? It's yeah. where you get to be you, get to say what you say, mm -hmm. and without it's having yours. to be like, oh, we got to fucking cut off in yeah. seven minutes. Yeah, or I got to sure. say this thing that this guy gave me a piece of paper. To Somebody say else wrote that, something. Yeah, exactly. Mouth. Take me back, though, to the beginning, man. How? Where does it all begin? Where do, where do you get the fucking idea that you should be up in front of people? Uh, the egotistical <laughs> idea of doing anything hubris. public. It takes hubris to kind of do this sort of thing. <laughs> what? Where did that come from? Where did you come from? I grew up in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. Um, I'm a poor black child. Uh, I mean, a joke and yet so literal. Um, you know, I, I, it's interesting because I never thought of myself as a funny kid and I wasn't a performer, but I come from funny people. Like my dad, my dad looks uh, like Action Jackson and I'm not fucking around. So he's muscly. He's actually. muscly, but he's got like that big man, like that black man mustache, just like robust and serious just the stash just no the beard. stash no beard and it's like it's it's just like licorice colored and glistening and he drove a motorcycle for most of my childhood so you had cool um dad. I, had a, I had cool dad who i hated i mean every every cool dad is the dad where i'm like i love your dad he's the gas and you're like oh i won't fuck me now that like get did, this yeah 
It's, I never say fuck me now in regards well, to my father. No, ever, well, no. But, so I mean, you know what I mean? Like a metaphorical fuck me now. Just well, what is the universe. The, what was the, uh, what was, why didn't you like him? Well, just when dad? you're a kid, you know, your dad, like my, my dad is the most hands on, active parent. You know, uh, like I smoked a lot when I was, uh, started cigarette, smoking, cigarette? like, yeah, cigarettes, cigarettes, like seventh grade. And, uh, and I kept insisting to my dad that I'd quit smoking. I was like, quit. I just smoked this because my friends are smoking. And, you know, and then I'd just be puffing away at the bus stop. My dad would be across the street, literally in all in leather on a black ninja, Kawasaki ninja, watching me through my, my like fucking binoculars. And my friends would be like, dude, that's your dad or a black Terminator. <laughs> what was he watching? So much, be- watching me just to see what I was doing. I just couldn't lie. Like, I just... I could Did he used my, to be special forces. I, my dad thing? grew up in Pittsburgh, which is almost like special forces. <laughs> <laughs> he just grew up with, you know, like only male child in his family. His dad died during World War II and four sisters and a mom. And my dad was during the man World of the War house II, fighting in World War II. He was a he was a seaman. Yeah, seaman. Yeah. So he died so in service. Yeah. Totally, see, really? I know at it, sea? It? Yeah. Yeah. At sea. You have a relative that died at war at sea. If he was black. So he probably just got pushed off the boat or something oh, like so that. Horrible. But I know. I would that, think some. about that, man. Did they ever recover a body? I don't know. Or is that guy well, just fucking things, lost? Yeah, the just ages. gone. Yeah, just gone. Isn't that weird, man? Yeah. Like in your family. I asked my dad, he goes, it was service related. That's all he'll tell me. Like he won't talk away anymore about Meaning it. Meaning like fucking yeah. a torpedo. Yeah, something. yeah, something like that. I don't know. I got to get it to deal. My dad, dad's old enough that I'm, he may go without ever telling me. This is fucking horrible and shouldn't happen to anybody or any parent. But I just read a news story. I mean, I'm now, I always add to the list of shit to be terrified about. <laughs> Death at sea is way up there. <laughs> really? That's, that's why I never joined any fucking oh. military service. Why I do I think Death at sea, sea would be okay? You're out of your mind. Think no? about the Natalie. Wood death. You're in the inky black darkness, drowning. Oh, fucking you just, calling you, out for Robert lie, Wagner. You lie people. back and you let the, you let the blackness take you. You're out of your mind. There's everything no is way. a sex metaphor with me. Well, all right. Well, what do you put it like that? <laughs> yeah, but in the sex metaphor, there's no. And then a shark bit yes, your fucking arm, or then off. your lungs fill with fluid. <laughs> <laughs> I read this fucking story today that was just like, oh god, another one to add to the list. Just happened in Florida, mm-hmm. um, and and I'm not going. This is another reason not to live in Florida, but. It's a, it's on a list of at least 500 reasons <laughs> it's not a long to live list. anywhere. There's a long list. There is a fucking dude who went to sleep. His brother. Uh-huh. He's got a, a, there's two brothers in the same house. He's got a wife and a kid. Good night. He goes to bed. Mm-hmm. Closes his door. Gets in his bed. A fucking sinkhole. <gasps> yes. Oh, I saw this too. Opens yes. up under the, his fucking bedroom and swallows him. <laughs> scre- I used to stop laughing. Look at him laughing. This is a horrible story swallows the man up whole he's screaming as he goes down his brother stop laughing look at her she's she's in tears laughing there's a vein in your forehead I feel terrible. um his brother rushes in to try to save him he gets trapped oh no okay <laughs> see how i'm acting so now sad. now you yeah you're stopping by your lip. Okay. like ah, <laughs> the misery of others um she the brother tries to save him i read this thing i was heartbroken he's like i tried to save him i could have swore i heard my brother calling for me oh. but i couldn't reach him but he had to get fucking rescued but now that i read that the deal is they can't get to the other brother like he's they think gone. he's he's gone he's huh he's swallowed by the earth and they don't even know if they could bring in That's equipment to pull him out that's what I'm saying. Like, and when something like that happens, who do you get mad at? Like, I read yeah. another article about uh, some cat in New Zealand got torn apart by four fucking sharks. One shark wasn't even a big one. Four footer came up, took a bite. The other ones were like. Smelled it, right? The feeding frenzy began, yeah. and they all attacked this fucking dude. And then the lifeguards came by and started pump shotgunning into the ocean, just flat out fucking firing right, into the ocean. Right, right, going bananas. Sharks, and this guy's dead. He he was Who dead long before they showed up. Point, well, exactly. Uh, if you're going to get eaten by sharks, yeah, that's the way to go. No, that's no! the way to go. Why yes. You, all Listen, of these I mean, deaths are choose, horrible. Here's the best choose. and only. Yeah, here's how you choose. In bed after you nutted. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, throw me in the ocean. Feed me to a shark. I'm just saying, if you're trying to think of like all the worst scenarios for death, yeah. being ripped apart by four sharks is highly superior to being nibbled to death by one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fair enough. So I'll there's that. that. Hopefully it's over quickly, right? And then... What's going through your head, though? Fuck! You're just... Uh, uh, what are the chances? What are the chances? What, cha- what are the chances? What are the chances? <laughs> oh, fuck me. All right, but not again. <laughs> but, then, but then being swallowed by a sinkhole, first of all, you're mad at God if you believe in it. If not, you're mad at, at the infernal chaos of things, right? Um, but, but or the- are you mad at the state of Florida? This house was built in 1974. Okay. Apparently, I did a little research. I, research. I read the article. Okay. There's I was going to say, Kevin, yeah. what you have so much time. What is, how do you get anything? Do you sleep? But you, come on. You fall down a rabbit hole and shit like yeah, this. Because the moment you're like, this story could affect me personally if I fall into a sinkhole, Sadly, you start reading up on it. Every internet rabbit hole ends with porn. 
So God, <laughs> I, did. I was like, like I got to catch up on the sinkhole. sinkhole. Finally, I was watching Goatsy pull his ass <laughs> apart, and I was like, oh, everything's right with the world again. <laughs> it just, and all of a sudden, there's like a whole new world of sinkhole porn you didn't know. It was <laughs> and it's pretty dirty. But, but being it's built on lime. limestone. This is why it happened. Oh, okay. When you build on limestone, apparently it's a porous rock. Mm. The wetter it gets, the fucking crumblier it gets. Mm. So it's like being, it's like building a house. On fucking uh, dry talcum powder that's solid. And, and inevitably it's going to go. Yes. But who the fuck knew Nobody. how deep it would go? They talked about a story, another story in Florida where like a whole fucking block and half of a pool and a million dollar home oh. also fucking eaten by a sinkhole. Wow. So now yet another thing to throw on the fucking it, list. It's a long list. This dude just goes back. He's 38 years old. Aisha. Young guy. And he's just got a wife and kid. And he's just oh, like, good night, everybody. Good I'm going to turn in early. Early. Oh, now I you, feel badly. You now wind badly. up in the belly of the earth. The of the earth. But who are Swallow you mad up? at in that instance? Can you get like his, his well, well, when you're dead, you're probably not mad the at The Greek anybody. god of earth. You think so? I don't, I can't think. I was going to think of his name. Mother Gaia. Mother you're just Ga- like, oh, Mother oh, Gaia. Gaia. Who built this house between the cleavage of Mother Gaia? You got to be mad, though. Like, when a death like that, with a shark death, you want to be mad. Like, I'm mad well, at the ocean. I shouldn't have been in the ocean, or I shouldn't have been in the ocean. You have no one can, to blame, and I got to tell you, at least he wasn't tempting fate. He went to bed. He, people die. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm dead inside. I realize that. <laughs> but you, yeah, you never the gonna, magic no, of people no, die? No, people die, man. You're going to die. This existence is empty and bleak, and I then you tell go. You, Scott Mosher's a little more fun and hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> Scott I'm Mosher's throwing, hoping he's going to get laid. I'm, I'm throwing things out there hoping for you to go, nah. Does Scott talk happen. about the fact that you smoke these things that look like strange, Let's jump hippie, on that. hippie marijuana you cigarettes? Were, she was, I, she was f- fascinated by this I'm before fascinated. we went. And I was like, wait, fuck it. Don't leave it in the locker room. Take it to the floor. I don't want you to feel, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. But Fire this away. is shit I smoked in middle school. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, right? I'm, I'm evolving backwards. Are I, you? Think about it. I took care of my shit early. You I was did it early. You were motivated, making shit. Done and right? done. So now I'm going backwards. Now like Kevin is in a bathrobe and under room. Like Benjamin Shorty Button. underoos smoking like, fucking Krakatoa Cortex. Like a fat <laughs> Benjamin Button. I'm going backwards in time. I love this it. This is the way it should be done, I think. Like, yes. I've been thinking about it a lot. It, weed is wasted on the youth, man. The That's kids true. in high school that I went to school with and shit, mm-hmm. like who burned and stuff mm-hmm. like that. You need this later in life when fucking shit's not going. When you so need well. the edges to be rubbed down. No yes. doubt. Yes. No doubt. When you're a kid, everything's fucking easy. Yeah. No. But- and you're smoking pot to get more mellow when you're 15. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like how much better do you want it? Exactly. Greedy pricks. <laughs> I'm gonna get high and then I'm gonna go home. Someone's gonna make me something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> this. Uh, she's talking about these cones I got. Though. I They're get these, crazy. These empty. They're basically pre-rolled uh, cigarette rolling papers. And then just you just premium stuff them with cigarette. whatever you like. You pack some weed. Yeah, I, I choose, of course, just au natural weed. You pack it with some ground up weed and you go for crazy. Wow. I used to be a cigarette smoker. Uh-huh. So this enabled me to quit cigarette smoking. So now you, but you're literally holding a giant joint as if it was a cigarette. You say giant like it's. Like, well, is that not a giant? Can I get a witness? Enormous, Does that look big? That looks really. like a it huge It looks like blunt. a cigarette. My assistant is, uh, is also of, of the Brown Persuasion and. and um, <laughs> I'm actually looking to see if he thinks it's a big one or a little one. I think it's big. I think it's, I think it's, it's impressive. Anything that looks like fit a, for a film a mogul, king size cigarette, for a for medium me? mogul, a medium, medium mogul. mogul. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said medium mogul. I was like, medium, you just won just my a heart. Medium mogul. Because usually <laughs> people are like XXXL mogul. <laughs> You're a medium mogul in my book, Kevin. Uh, we're going back to you. I'm not going to let you take it off. Okay. But these are cones, and how it operates is they're empty rolling papers. You pour in weed, you twist, and that's you exciting. It makes it easier to smoke. Like think about it. you know, have you known people who are like I start rolling my own cigarettes because it makes me slow down and smoke less. Yes, yes. This is the answer to that. <laughs> fill it up, stuff it in. Totally. Make burrito, three in a row. Burrito without filling. <laughs> um, all right, so take me back. So you're being raised by a dad who is essentially a, a, milit- a Marine of but, some but, sort. A, but like a funny Marine. So like a guy who tells great yeah. stories, a guy who uses the word motherfucker liberally, a guy who like would kick all the shit off this table to tell a story. Like he's that guy. He's like whip the tablecloth off the table. And then that motherfucker right there, man, fuck the spotted owl in the ass. He's that guy. So you were raised by so Reggie Hammond I was. in 48 hours. <laughs> I was, I was. <laughs> Reggie Hammond and Action Jackson had a baby. That was my dad. And uh, and just the funniest guy, you know, construction worker. He did mm. every did every kind Kind of like a uh, hard labor job. You know, he was a construction worker. He was He's a, a meat, man who worked with his hands. Yes, with his hands. He was a meat cutter. He was a, he, he was a butcher. He was a deep sea fisherman. Can I and, ask you uh, a quick question? Yeah. If, when, since you're raised by a man who works with his hands, mm-hmm. were you ever satisfied with a girly man like myself who's just 
Like, oh, I, I write and st- I write my feelings down. I talk about what's on my mind and shit like that. Sometimes I blow it out into monologues. I wish other people talk about what's on my mind. Sometimes I drop wicked truth in a one page monologue. I've always felt less of a man. Like, even my father, who worked for the post office, but didn't like hump mail, he right. worked canceling stamps in a sexual mm-hmm. center. That guy seemed like more of a man because A, he had to like mow the lawns on the weekend, and mm-hmm. B, he did a job he hated. That to right. me is a man. Somebody that is that's like, oh yes, that's a, a guy. Man, that's an adult. Not that's an adult. Man. Yes, going and doing something with distaste and yet showing up every day. Absolutely. I've never felt like an adult. I've never lived. I've never had to work with my hands. A few jobs I've had to work with my hands. I was like, fuck. All it made me want to do is find a job where I didn't. I gravitate <laughs> toward convenience store shit where I'm pushing buttons and right. shit like Rosie Robot. Just me stand there and be sarcastic and push a button. Very pretty much. Where like <laughs> until somebody's like, what did you say? I'm like nothing. You know. <laughs> But that's my point. If you're raised by a man, were you only attracted to men or did you? But because I know you play geek games and you're, yeah. you're like a guy's girl. I'm more nerdy than my dad, for sure. It's interesting, though, because uh, my husband, from a personality perspective, is the opposite of my father. Like, he's super interior and quiet. Man? Oh, he's a fucking man. What oh, does yeah. he do? He builds. <laughs> oh. Dumb question. So was, uh, what is, does he build? No, no, no. He's an attorney, but he does build. So here's <laughs> the thing. He's an attorney, but he does build. So, like, he's this really interior kind of funny, quiet guy. Okay. But, like, he's like, I just built a saw hole out of lift over lumber that's what he does on the weekend i'm like baby what you do is like i made this shelf for does my computer that equipment voice when he talks to you just to in my just in my head when i'm trying to where'd get you in meet the mood. in college is my college boyfriend get out of here Seth, sophomore year so you guys been together how since long? college oh my god 19 years 19 years in May. are you are you one of those ladies that's like i don't fucking talk about my age you prick uh no it's too late because it's on the internet but i'm very old in the age of the internet Se- like, you can't really do that shit anymore yeah, no. actually, you look fucking fantastic Not right man. right so Basically. wait, you met this man in college and you stayed with him? Stayed with him. You have a podcast called Girl on Guy, which sounds so fucking suggestive. And you've <laughs> no, been with the same fucking guy. <laughs> I started early. Almost 20 years. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's ridiculous. Where'd you guys meet? Doing what? Um, well, I was dating his best friend. That's how we met. So there you Is go. Is that guy still in his life? Yes. And he came to our wedding and uh, and we just... Um, we and when just you say dating, him. do you mean... <clears throat> yeah. I mean fucking, definitely fucking. The fuck out of here. Yeah, I was definitely fucking. That, now, come on. <laughs> I well, you know, I got for the to, first like f- few months of your relationship. Did that bug your man, or is he so like? No, he's he won. So my, my dude won. Right, yeah, he won. See, man, that's like I didn't have that alpha thinking. <laughs> No, like, like, even if I would have won, I would have been like, what was the other guy? Like, you probably like the other guy better. <laughs> now there's a rabbit hole. You should never go down. Uh, yeah, well, never that's fucking down. the story of Just my life. Take, take some yoga classes, learn some tricks, <laughs> and put that dude out of her mind. What is, what is, so where did you guys meet? Doing what? Some kind of I just, you know, I, I got to, I went to Dartmouth and, uh, and, oh, and oh, yeah, okay. and I, he, I don't think my husband no would object idea. or lie, uh, would object to this, but I like him big. Cause, you know, I, when I was in high school, all the guys were really tiny. Right. So by the time I got to college, finally, there were like guys bigger than me. So, um, now, I did some athletes. I did you steal my beating heart when you say big. I, I don't. Yeah, I, yes, you, <laughs> you mean always, muscly you'll and shit. always be my medium mogul. <laughs> you mean tall? <laughs> tall the football players. I did. Okay. It, yeah, I was. I was kind of working <laughs> on a corner. Of the There's a bunch team. of guys listening, going <gasps> full of hope <laughs> and, as you redefine winch big. Winch up my shorts. You mean more tall? Yes, in I the do big mean and tall. Tall, equation. tall. So he was a big dude. He was a big dude. He's like six in college. He was like six seven. You're kind of two, tall too. Two, 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 six, How, two, what are you? I'm six. I'm six feet tall. Yeah, you're definitely tall. Yeah, you me big lady, big lady. Big but I make everybody feel. I like. I like. I make. I try to make the men in my life feel always feel large. How do you do that? Just by leaning and stooping a little. <laughs> no. <laughs> Subvert your fucking Amazonian <laughs> womanhood while I just lean on a wall. I was like, Kevin is playing footsie with me, and his toes are very wet. But there's an animal. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Hey, come here. I do. I've not only do I have toes, but I have a prehensile tongue. Prehensile tongue coming. My toes. Your toes, second toe is licking my foot. That would be a really great way to come on to a lady. But we were like, is this toe licking and my? I'm like, foot? I hear you like big guys. <laughs> All right, take us wetness. back. Take us back to your dad. Then okay. why do you, you keep saying dad? No mom. Is mom no, no. I, so my mom is a super big part of my life, and okay. she's awesome. But uh, my parents divorced when I was like How ten. Old? Ten, and then um, how many no, siblings you got? Just it? one. Brother so, or sister? sister, younger sister. So, so she was. So she was harder? six. She took it a lot harder than I did. But also because they weren't rich, they didn't fight over anything because there was nothing to fight about. So they just were like, "All right, we're calling it. Boom! You take one, I'll take the other. See you on the other side." So that's, yeah. that, that's what would have happened if my parents. Divorced. Yeah, they were like, you know, it's been real. So my mom took my sister, and my dad took me because he was like, "Which one can care for itself?" <laughs> I no. was big enough to like you know make meals and clean up after myself. So he took me. It's a smart call. Yeah. How far apart did you guys live? Uh, we both lived in Oakland. Like I grew up in San Francisco, but then we both lived in Oakland for a while. And then my dad and I moved back to San Francisco. So yeah, like not far to take the bus to my mom's house. I talked to her all the time, right. you know, call her for advice and stuff. Does like that. Does that shape what you do? Having uh, your parents split up at all? 
you know, it's it's funny because I want to be one of those people who has feelings and stuff, um, <laughs> <laughs> feels shit. But uh, it was just like I don't know. Kids are pretty uh, malleable. They just you just deal with the situation that you're in. I loved it. Uh, my dad was um, hands on enough to shape me and give me like discipline and a work ethic. But not so hands on. Um, but but you know, but hands off enough to let me do my own thing. So my dad was like really big on independence. He's like, you have a couple of responsibilities and fill, fulfill those responsibilities, and pretty much you can do whatever you want. What was he like I, with the boys? Um, terrifying, but um, terrifying. And then he gave up because he had his own dating life, and he's like, if I keep an eye on you, I can't get laid myself. So goodbye. Um, he tells my dad tells the best story about uh, I snuck out once to go dancing. Where and, uh, to what to like to like an awful club like an eighteen and over club and I'm, I've been this tall since I was like eleven so I could sneak into it. It's <laughs> called the Palladium. It was in North Beach, right, right around from Lola, the place with the giant flash and teddy. So I used to go there all the time. It was near, during the New Wave era. It's a terrible, terrible period of our nation's cultural history. <laughs> and um, how dress of like kind of a giant like lumpy black Madonna. And my dad and I, he told me I couldn't go dancing this one night, so I snuck out. You know, I did the thing like the after school special where you build a body out of pillows and then you like you know sneak you literally out the did the Ferris Bueller absolutely. Which by the way does not work. Yeah. Has never worked except for in movies. So I climb out the window. My friends drive me down there, and my dad hears the fucking window go up. I mean, he's like this bitch. So he gives me like a tough time to get down there, and then he just comes and pulls up in front, and then the guys are like, "There's a black Terminator on a motorcycle waiting for you." <laughs> <laughs> and uh and uh, you know i, I don't even say anything my dad was on side he doesn't say anything you know he just looks at you and you're like oh i have to puke so i, I he grounds me and the story he tells us that i grounded you but i immediately realized that if if you had to be home i had to be home watching you i was never gonna get to go out so i took you off grounding like the next day i was you like had super dad i had i did have super dad i mean he was he was a loving dad but he was also ambivalent dad but but he was a loving ambivalent dad he was just like what do you mean ambivalent dad? well you know he just he he worked really hard he worked like 70 hour a week so he wasn't around all the time right uh, i felt loved i felt cared for the house was safe there was always food i always had money i knew he'd show up if i needed him but he this was not helicopter i don't know about your parents this was not helicopter parenting oh time. i am a helicopter parent oh see my dad i was like dad i need a ride to this party it's in the middle of the worst part of town i might get murdered he's like well see how it goes yeah he, i mean he was just not a pick up and drive their dad so weird ever to say that. i ever. was thinking about my own man the other day when i was walking and i love my father he's a great guy he's, he's passed now he's got he's fucking he's dead i hate saying past he I, fucking died, <laughs> he died. I, it was nuts thanks for coming over to my side of <laughs> yeah, things oh, I can't people die kevin nice. they people fucking die. Die. yeah he didn't fall in a sinkhole but shit his heart <laughs> fell in some sort of sinkhole. oh no but i was thinking about like i when i tend to talk about him you know people uh, say oh you loved your father so much and i go yeah of course i did but I think that was the kind of relationship we had. Like mm -hmm. he had enough interest in me to take like one day a week for me at three kids. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he worked at night at the post office. Mm -hmm. So he was, you know, he'd get home at seven in the morning. Sleep and shit, probably, right? Sleep, yeah. And say goodbye to everyone as we went to school, go to sleep, get up in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So we'd see him then and stuff. Then he'd go to sleep for a few more hours, get up at night and go to work. So, you know, he'd come to the shows. If he did a play or something, he'd be there on the Saturday night show, not the Friday night show. Mm -hmm. But he worked a fucking shit ton. And when he wasn't working, um, you know, he fucking he always had a series of shit to do because my mom like, mow this long, mow my mom's long because she lived around the corner from us, my grandma. So, you know, and, and I remember him like sitting there listening to music by himself. He was mm -hmm. one of these country music fans. God mm -hmm. love him. Um, which is probably why I'm in not Jersey, a right? Jersey. Fan. It's crazy. I don't get it. Yeah. And then not even like South Jersey. Where you know, <laughs> right. it, it makes sense where they're, they're fucking hee hawing it up. <laughs> it, it was just this weird kind of blip in the, in the family. His, his brother and sisters like country music. I don't know why. So this was a guy that didn't really ask for much, didn't really do much and shit. And I thought about the time, the quality time we spent together, we really didn't spend talking. Yeah. Like he'd pick me up from school on a Wednesday, half day, and then we'd go see a movie every fucking week. Every week oh. I'd be like, a relative has died. I have to leave early. That's adorable. And every week fucking our family was dropping like rats. Like <laughs> in the Catholic school, they're like, you've much. lost a lot of relatives. <laughs> but they were Catholics, so they understood because totally. they tend to have a lot of relatives. I was like, my uncle Indiana Jones has died. <laughs> and they wouldn't know for years because they don't watch that kind of oh, shit. Oh, they don't consume that devil worship. <laughs> but uh, he was also, I mean... That's kind of like what he was. He didn't have his own thing going on, like a dating life or fucking riding around on a cool bike and shit or, or just going out and doing his thing. But he, he, he was kind I guess ambivalent is kind of right. Yeah. Like I think about the parent that I am and I was shaped by the parents that I had and they mm -hmm. were absolutely loving. And my mother, of course, was more present than my dad because he worked more. But at the same time, they weren't as engaged. I think that, I'm so engaged in my daughter's like, life. I feel like it's engaged nuts. is important. You know what I mean? I feel like if I had kids, I'd probably be pretty engaged. But one thing I'm really grateful for is my, my dad was like, his ambivalence had purpose. He was like, 
you've got to figure out how to do this shit on your own. You've got to do it. You've got to figure out how to get around on your own. You've got to figure out how to live. You're, not, you're only going to be with me for another couple of years. I'm not going to be the kind of dad that does this thing for you because then you're going to be out there going to be a fucking failure. So get out. If you want something, go do it. And it's interesting because it made me pretty fearless, which is great. I mean, also pretty idiotic because I would just run headlong into shit without thinking. But my dad was like, go do it. See how it goes. If, if you fuck it up, you can do it again. But, you know, I mean, like, don't come to me asking right. me how to do it. Just go figure out how to fucking do it. I couldn't fathom being that guy. Why? You Interesting. You just want to live the, your kid's life for him. Be like, hold on. I've done. It's like it's having a kid is like watching someone play a video game. Right, right, where you right. You just want to grab the controller. You're like, like hey, a, hey, a, I can B, do B, it Up, down, you. up, down, left. Yes. <laughs> oh, God, yes. And you just can't. And there have been moments where my kid, she's the presence of mind of a 13-year-old now mm-hmm. where she's just like, you know, one day I was just like, kid, this is nothing or whatever, right, right. Some, some problem of hers. And she was like, you know, not for nothing, but you make me feel stupid when you say that. Mm-hmm. I understand that this is nothing. And but it's big to me now. And she's yeah, saying, she's yeah. like, I've never gone through it. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I'm bet my bad. I said, mm-hmm. my, all I'm trying to do is flip the microscope and show you that it's in the grand scheme small. of things. It's yeah. going to be. But I said, yeah. for you, you can't pull your eye away from the microscope because this is the first time. You're experiencing everything. Yeah. So, you do. You just want to grab the controller for him. It's yeah. Nice. And your dad didn't. Your dad he was never just like, did. My dad was controller. like, here's the controller. And also, here's the console. Figure out how to plug it in and where the electricity <laughs> is. <laughs> he did a thing that everybody always thinks is so crazy, although he, he was really present. When my, my sister and I were maybe like eight and five, uh, four, almost, she was almost five, we got up for Easter morning and no one was in the house. And uh, there was like a trail of candy through the house and there were little signs and it was like, get dressed. And my sister and I are alone and we're eight, literally eight and five, get dressed, go out of the house. And there's signs all the way down the street to the bus stop. And then we get on a bus and there's somebody waiting with a sign on the bus. And the we took, fuck yeah, out of here. Yeah. And then we take and we get off and we transfer. There's someone waiting at the transfer stop with another sign. We get that sign. We take the bus all the way from Oakland to San Francisco, which was like probably an hour long, like endeavor, maybe longer. And then our parents are waiting for us at like a smorgasbord restaurant. And we did it all on our own. Like it was just now my dad said, by the way, everybody who met us was someone he knew, like obviously he right. set it all up. They were all friends. And um, he was following the bus on his motorcycle because that was what, how he got down. But in our heads, we were like, we are doing this all by ourselves. Right. And he was like, I just wanted to see a um, to show you that you could do it and B to see how you reacted. And if you guys had flipped the fuck out, I would have come and rescued you. But, right. you know, he was just really about pushing the birds out of the nest. He's like, you know, little bird, you're going to fall eventually. I'm just going to push you and let you deal with it. And uh, and I at the time, there were times when I thought he was mean. Absolutely. I was you're being mean. You know, my friends get their parents, take them everywhere. And my, and my dad was like, I don't give a fuck. Um, he but was now, talking to oh yeah, oh absolutely. At my wedding, um, when my poor, sweet husband's Irish Catholic family came out from Pennsylvania, I was like, "If you could just not use the word motherfucker, I know it's uh, a term of endearment for you, but I don't think they've ever heard it. <laughs> so, um, if you could just not do that, but um, but I love it now because it it may, gave me all of my bravery. It, right. You know what I mean? That gave me all of my bravery. I really am grateful to him for that, for sure. Um, is boy, you had wicked cool childhood. Yeah, man. it was all right. You know, my dad did it. He never did the bus thing with us, which sounds very fucking cool. It like, was neato. Yeah, like totally. Like now yeah. I'm sitting there going, how can I apply that to my kid? But well, she's I remember thirteen, when- but you can do stuff like you can, uh, like you know, when she's fifteen or sixteen, like maybe. I used to go camping. Like I had friends and I, when I got a car, we would just like, I would be, dad, I'm going camping in Oregon for two days. And we, we would like drive on our own. What did he say? Yeah. He was pretty much down with it. Shit. If he knew oh, the people I was I'm going with. For that. Yeah. I can't do that. I almost yet. died once too. Doing what? We were, it was. I was asked you before, like you were like, I've done some crazy shit. I'm oh, like, yeah. all right, how crazy does it get? Um, I've definitely almost died a couple of times in my life. Doing what? Um, well, once like getting so drunk bungee? at a party that I, that like, and then not, not knowing where I was, that, that was like probably the most terrifying thing that I ever had. Where was this? Visiting my grandmother in DC when I was God, it's such a fuck. Kids are so fucking stupid. Uh, went to a party, just went, you know, and drank too much, and uh, Your kid, and like yeah, and I didn't, yeah, and I said, yeah, definitely underage, like seventeen, maybe, and didn't know the people at, who I was at the party, and uh, and the cops had to bring me home, and you know, yeah, like just terrible, terrible. Kids are so dumb. Yeah, Ugh, kids are just a ball of dumb with feet, right? But um, no, I uh, we were camping, and it was, and uh, we we were, it was snowing, and um. We came out of this park. We were we had been we had been cave we had been spelunking like cave climbing and cave okay. climbing. So we we leave at the end of the weekend and it's snowing, it's freezing, and I'm in a little European. My first car was it's a little red German car, little hatchbacky kind of thing. Okay, and uh, come out and um, we we should have turned left and we turned right and we're just going up this mountain and going up this mountain and going up this mountain and all of a sudden we're in like six feet of snow and the car's stuck and it's dark. There are no lights. There's no phones. This is before cell phones. 
Um, we're in a tiny little uninsulated car with a four cylinder engine and like very little food. And, uh, and it's, and the, the park is closed. Like we've gone up a road that's closed right. essentially. And, uh, and we couldn't, couldn't get the car out. And how many and people in the car? Four. And, uh, who would you have eaten first? Oh God. They were all so skinny. There was one girl who complained a lot. I would have definitely eaten her. <laughs> she, she was, she was one of those people who like, she was literally like, game over, man. She was that fucking person. She I was gave like, up. Oh God, it's <laughs> going down. Like yeah. You're ready to die. So let's go. Let's do this. Um, uh, but then we had we had got we went and like broke sticks out of trees and like rocked the car back and forth and like pushed it. You were like it like a the, like a a very tame version of survive. Yeah, where yeah, you didn't yeah. have to fucking eat somebody's. No, food or thank like God. That. Um, but when you say you almost died, I think that's the, the incident. Like, I, had you guys? Been I think there a little I, longer? I think that if we had been there, like it was very cold. If, right. That if we had been up there, the car the car um, wasn't the kind of car you could have run for heat. You know what I mean? Wasn't the kind of car, like it was, you know, it had like, you know, remember old German, like, you know, even like a BMW 2002 where like, you know, those rattly glass that like, the gasket doesn't, isn't tight. You know what I mean? We would have frozen in that car. I think the overnight. fact that you use the term gasket means you know more about cars than I do. <laughs> you look like a man who knows shit. Kevin. I, d- I know shit about, I know fucking useless shit, shit where I'm <laughs> like, I hope everything maintains this first world status we got. Cause the moment fucking a dystopian society, society arrives and whatnot, People have to live on their fucking fists and strength. And what can you provide for people? I am fucked. I know this every day of my life. I wake up, I go, thank God I'm alive right now. Right now, this moment. Any I feel, other time? I feel that way myself. Oh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Any other time, man. I know it. I and know it, it just makes you think like, wow, somebody like years from now, 10, 20, 50 years from now is going to be like, thank God I live in this time. So Kevin, it's going to be If get you better. were living in dystopian, a uh, dystopian future, you'd be the governor because you're a fast talker. You'd be able to seduce people into following <laughs> I that you. that fucking fast. <laughs> you can do it. You, yeah, you I would be seductive. the guy going, who should we eat first? <laughs> <laughs> just from the back. Uh, excuse me. We could just we could make a list. I know a thing or two about meals and uh, <laughs> I hate to be this guy, but I'll be that guy. So I'm not the guy on the plate. <laughs> what? Okay. So when do you decide, Hey man, I want to be in front of people. Um, well, like I went to a performing, I went to a, one of those magnet schools when in high school, and um, you were I was smart kid. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I don't know. Looking, ugh, who says that out Great loud? Smart. I was nerdy, nerdy, very nerdy. You got the grades. Very bookish. Got the grade. Definitely had the grades. That was that was the agreement with my dad. Get, get the grades. Did you get straights or are they? Mixed? I was I was like I was like an A minus student. No, holy shit! Yeah, I was like an A minus student. That's but why I was he got also, a lot of leeway. He's like she's smart. Yeah, I mean, I you know I was I was a total apple polisher. Mm. Um. And, uh, oh, you know, someone said this to me the other day and I, and I, when he said it, it seemed kind of, um, like brash, but it, I, school was easy. It was like, well, just one of those things was easy. Like, I'm not saying I was smart, but I'm saying I knew how to do school. Totally. Like, I knew how to get it done. It was you very simple play, for like, me. Like, yeah. Yeah. I just, I never, not until I got to college did I ever really struggle. You know what I mean? I just did the work and it got done. Did you feel impatient? Like, fuck. Oh, I got in fights with my teachers all the time. In high school? Oh yeah. Like, I because remember- like the impatience of, I know I'm supposed to be doing something that's but, and I know this step is necessary, but Jesus is taking so right. long. Well, I had like worn out, like I'd worn out the English track at my high school. So I was in senior English, like during maybe sophomore year and all the, Why, the because you like to write or you just because it? I, I just, I, my parents didn't believe in TV. So I started reading really early and I never watched television. I mean, I would be like the kid on the bus, like with the Bradbury, like collection, you know, waking up at the turnaround, the bus, like I'd pass my stop like two hours before. And I read I mean, I read so much science fiction, Heinlein and and Ursula Gein. I mean, like, I was crazy into sci-fi. Um, so I was just were a big... you pretty as well? No, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 not well, attractive you, at all. Man, you're pretty now, so how could you not uh, be attractive then? Str- drugs, you're high, you're very stoned. Stop, you're right. uh, no, I was. Um, I guarantee. So you, just I imagine pull a picture of you in youth. You probably. Look oh, cool. I have a great picture. I'll show it to you before we go. I was, I was a science fair, a Casio calculator watch, giant Urkel up, glasses. You're the fucking. That's a dream girl, man. No, like if the, not back then, I wasn't. I was really? like, really. If I my... saw a little girl sitting there reading Brad, Brad, Bradbury, I'd be like, and even if she was in classes, I was like, holy shit. I'm gonna show you a picture. You're gonna die laughing. Right, Oracle with press. So um, <laughs> you sold me. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That is not no sweat, that my pet. Guess. That's tremendous. <laughs> but um, oh, so it was the so yeah, so good in school, and then I went to this magnet school. Oh, and in the school, like I went to the senior English when I was a sophomore, and I, I would re- they would do these tests every week where there'd be a spelling test, and then at the end of the spelling test, there were each each correct answer would have a circle around one of the letters, and then you'd get a jumble, and whoever got the jumble fastest would get a prize. Okay. So I just won the jumble so many weeks in a row that I was banned from doing the jumble. 
And so then I would just hold my test up so that the whole row behind me could cheat off of my test. You were like, I, just, I was contemptuous of, you know, authority. And I got in a fight with one of my teachers because whenever I'd ask a question, she would have to look it up in like the study, like the teacher's guide. And I was just like, don't you know anything that's come out of that fucking book? You know, I mean, I was like, I was precocious. a little shit. Yeah. Precocious <laughs> with is better. Language yeah, mixed exactly. in. <laughs> I just, I was just like, you know, it felt, it felt like she had a contempt for others. Like she wasn't doing the work. Like, why am I doing the work when you're not doing the work? Right. Um, and you were just young enough and smart enough to see the like, hey, this this the street goes both ways. Right, and you're doing a disservice. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, you know, you're being a babysitter when you need to be a teacher. And luckily, I d- did do so well in school that I kind of kept getting a free pass mm-hmm. behaviorally because because no teacher ever wants to hear that. No, no one wants to hear, hey, dumbass. Yeah, you know what <laughs> do I mean? your job. Yeah, I, from did, one I, of the kids. Did, I did this in fourth grade. No one wants to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> you beat the shit. <laughs> so, um, my school had um a magnet arts program, and I. You know, as as anyone who's ever been on my show, I will tell you, um, it's always a boy. So I met this boy. It was an actor. And I followed him into his, his improv class. And I started doing improv that way. And then. How old were you? 15. Uh, and the boy was. You never thought about performance? Before? No, never, never, never. I was very interior. Go ahead. The, the boy was what? Sam Rockwell. The fuck out of here. Is that true? <laughs> yes, it is true. That's so weird because I was sitting there going, what, is, what special boy leads oh, yeah. a. He was a guy who went on. To <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, oh my God, that's yeah, nuts. Yeah. So because of him, you wind up going to the acting class. So I started going to the acting class and then I moved into that program. Do you like improv? Uh, I love improv. I love improv. Yeah. Um, I'm, I don't know if I'm good at it, but being a stand up, I feel like you kind of have you, to be. Yeah, you get degree. if you, yeah, I mean, my, the guys I really love, the guys that I admired when I was a baby comic, baby comic. Uh, like Mark Maron or Tom <laughs> Rhodes or hi, Dougie. <laughs> Um, were all guys who made it look like they were just making it up on the top. You know what I mean? It always felt like that, even though you knew it wasn't like that. I was always the comedy I wanted to do. Right. Shaggy, we're talking about comedic legends. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so my comedy, even though I, I have a set, I always try to get up there and make something different happen every time. Totally play so, the room. Yeah. Yeah. I just night. want it to feel new to me. So it feels new to people. So yeah, I do like improv. Hey kids, trustworthy Kev Smith here. Let you know, we'll be back in a moment for more of this fine Smodco podcast. But until then, bear with me. I got to pay some bills. Stamps.com. All right. Playing post office had never been more fun. Even when, you know, back in the day, playing post office was kissing you know like uh you get together the party and like i got a letter for you kiss that's horse shit compared to playing post office with stamps.com man odds are you're most productive when you're working from your desk am i right i am i know i am i chain myself to that desk start smoking weed in the morning i just get shit done so leaving just to go to the post office man that's gonna slow shit down that's not productive That's why you need Stamps.com, man. With Stamps.com, you buy and print official U.S. postage right from your own computer and printer. Can you imagine? This is shit I dreamed about when I was a kid. Oh, if only I could make the stamps. Now you are the fucking stamp maker, man. You go to Stamps.com, you click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, you type in S-M-O-D, man. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to send you a free scale. Can you believe that shit? Nobody sends you something for nothing anymore, man. You're going to be able to automatically calculate the exact postage you need for any letter or package, any class of mail, because you got your own fucking scale, thanks to these stamps.com geniuses, man. You will never waste valuable time going to the post office again. Never run into some sort of a criminally bent uh, supervillain of some sort. The postmaster. You know, the day, the one day you choose to go to the fucking post office, you know is the day that the postmaster has come. That would be the day that the postmaster would strike. But it don't matter, man. Let him strike away if you got stamps.com because you don't have to go to the post office anymore, man. I use stamps.com right here at the house. They use it back in the office uh, in Jersey because it, it's ingenious. Stamps.com makes you the post office. You don't have to sit around Wait for the place to open. You're not beholden to their hours anymore. You are the motherfucking post office. Right now, go to stamps.com, click on the microphone, type in SMOD. You're going to get a no-risk trial, $110 bonus offer, includes that digital scale I was talking up, and $55 in free postage. Don't wait, man. Go to stamps.com before you do anything else. Click on that microphone, type in SMOD. It's the future, bitch. Drag your fat ass into it or your thin ass. I don't want to leave the normies out. Drag yourself into the future by never dragging your ass, thin, fat, or otherwise, to the post office again. Stamps.com.
So first you were in the in the arts program. Mm-hmm. When how does that lead to you standing up from so, the mic and being like I'm funny? I left there, went to Dartmouth, was going to be a lawyer, but did like on the side, did sketch and improv on the side. Graduated. All through college, yeah, like it was in one of those infernal singing groups, those in, intolerable whiff and poofs and the dibble bops and the decibels. I was in a group called the Rockapellas. I haven't heard anyone fucking reference the whiff and poofs. <laughs> In a good 15 years. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's my pleasure. <laughs> I'm all about the rustic references. <laughs> um, rustic East Coast references. And then, and we How did you like Dartmouth? Uh, That's uh, what we call it. Dart- New Jersey, yeah, Dartmouth. Yeah, Dartmouth. <laughs> like the street? Yeah. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. You know, I went, I grew up in a really progressive place. When I got in, I was trying to say where to go to college. My college, my high school college, you know, counselor said, don't go there. It was a really conservative East Coast school. It was like, you're going to martyr your college career. You're going to be miserable. Why uh, martyr your college career? I don't know if you remember this, but at the time, it was when a lot of places and schools were still invested in South Africa. It was like the whole divestiture movement. And um, there was a big protest at Dartmouth where they built this shanty town. A lot of colleges build shanty towns like on the green. So there was a big shanty town at Dartmouth on the green. And in the middle of the night, these like ultra conservative students destroyed it with sledgehammers and almost killed somebody. The fuck out of here. So, um, yeah. So it was just, it didn't seem like a hospitable place for a young brown girl in Birkenstock. But, <laughs> <laughs> and yet turned out to I be. I loved it. You know, I was like, don't tell me what to do. I'm going there. You know, and I love, I loved that I was so different from everybody. I love being other. I like to be other. I'd been other so much my life than I was what I was used to. Becomes your badge. Oh, yeah, it. absolutely. You like to be the one, you know. So. Now, when when you're there, um, do you make friends that you're still with today? Oh, yeah. Or Besides really? my husband? Yeah, for oh, sure. Uh, so I guess yeah, your best that. friend in life. Yeah, 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 there's that one. Uh, and then, um, yeah, you know, my best, best, closest friends in life, the ones I spend the most time with other than my dude is um, my grade school friends. So, like, two of my best friends now. My oldest friend was in my wedding. I was in his wedding. We've known each other since eighth grade. It's a guy? It's a guy. Yeah. The growing I think, starts to make more sense when you hear about my life. Single dad, motorcycles, video games, best friends, a guy. Yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> um, and then, um, so that, so he's my oldest friend. Him and like one other guy that I knew since eighth grade. I've known, I've still see them all the time and talk with them all the time. And then there are three men, three, they're all guys that I've known since then that are still my really close friends. And then I've got like two really close friends from college, two or three really close friends from college. And and then, you know, a couple of friends that I'm, I'm, I'm very I don't, I, I know a lot of people, but I don't, I don't plus one a lot of, you know what I mean? I, it's, this, I don't know, this business, you meet a million people, but it's hard to like really. I've, I've, I've tried to shrink it. Like over the years, yeah, you meet a bunch of people and then I like, this is what I try to do. Never yeah. leave the house now. Yeah. So <laughs> then you're meeting all the Mastered. people that you're like, anybody wants to come over here. I'm like, I'm happy to meet you. <laughs> but I spend a lot of time with my lady other than when I'm not doing one of the Work. fucking things yeah. of, that I'm trying to do, I usually spend downstairs in the room with her. And this is going to sound fucking pathetic, but watching Frasier reruns. That, you know, until Uber you said, fr- until you said Frasier, I was, st- I was with you. <laughs> what, what, what is the, what do you watch? Um, what do we watch? Uh, and well, by the way, Frasier is just like the last six months prior to that. You, you, go, you through go through phases. Roseanne you go through phases. Was the longest running one news radio. I just love that you're going back so far over, but it's, it's, what it is, it's not me going, Oh, I've never seen these. I've, I You've watched them, them when they aired. I've watched them afterwards. <laughs> There's something comforting about the familiar. Yes. You know, it's, like it's, it's soothing. Like, it is very it's soothing. It's like playing music. If you're a music person, you play yeah. music over and over, maybe you play one album side to side. Mm-hmm. It's the same kind of thing, the familiarity. And I've also been in more of an output than input yeah. stage lately. So you want to shut down a little bit and just relax. And honestly, I think it's easier to look at older shit if i'm going to vacate like i'm ready to create but if i'm going to vacate i it's tougher to vacate with the new because and tell me if if you if this hits any nerve for you um i don't want to see something that's going to make me feel competitive or like fuck i got up my game because this is where it is now and shit like that so i like here i i love south park yeah. And I stopped watching South Park season two. <laughs> can do it. Because I was reason. like, if I do this, I'm going to stop what I do because it's painfully clear to me <laughs> that I'm not in the same league as these gentlemen. So yeah. I just like, I, and you I'm not like, it fuck it, I hate South I no. love South Book Park. Book of Mormon made me feel, it's just a few Small. things make me feel that way. Book of Mormon made me feel puny, intellectually puny. Yeah. And also, um, I said, I, I say this all the time and I got to stop name checking this motherfucker, but I love watching comedy. And I don't not watch it because I don't want to. It's mainly because I don't have time. Right. And I also don't want to internalize too many people's acts because I hate it if like their stuff is floating through my my head. Right. But I can't watch Bill Burr because I'm just like, fuck, I wish I wrote that. Fuck, I wish I wrote really? that. Really? He's, he's yeah, your guy? Yeah, he's so – because other guys, you just go, that guy's funny. Right. I'm funny too. We're different funny. We're funny in a different way. 
that's a guy you're like, oh, you know what I mean? Like just Carlin said that about Kinnison. Carlin's in his book. He said the only person that really made him go. Hmm. Right. Was Sam Kinison when he did his like, you should move to where the food is bit. He was like, that was brilliant. <laughs> and I should have written that. It, is that. I should have done that. I should be pushing myself harder. But, you know, see, I'm still in the place where I want to watch. You have to consume that, especially yeah. current because you're on a fucking. Yeah. But hey, like, we're talking about people what's do that happening. for us, though. Thank God we just show up and they go, here's what's on the news. But that's why I would love that job because because of that. It would force you to. Yes. Get, yeah. Just like I would be other than waking up and reading Google News and shit like I would be forced to ingest. More right. Current. Right. And because it's part of your gig. Right. So that, I don't know that that I would find appreciate, especially if somebody was like. Here, this is what everyone's talking about today. Yeah. Like, oh, fantastic. Yeah, it is, it is. It does. It does put you. I mean, it's, it's not like we're talking about the sequester. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> but it does kind of put you. I mean, the nice thing about our show is that it's it, it feels gossipy, but it's it, we and, you know, sometimes we talk a little bit of smack, but it's more about like, here's something that's happening. How does that how does that relate to the way that you see the world? Right. So it's like, you know, uh, Kevin Smith stays at home and fills up uh, empty plunge sheds, uh, <laughs> cigarettes with dope and wears a bathroom all day long. If you could stay home all day, what would you do? Right. So that it never is about us beating up on you or or, or lauding you. It's right. just about like, okay, this is something that happened. And We're how, presenting you know, making the it personal. Submitted yeah. for your approval. You're yes, like Rod exactly. Sterling. Submitted for your approval. A crew of Rod Sterling. Um, yeah. So in that way, it's it's um it's nice because it it always ends up being about like your own perspective on the world and, and you know, how you feel about things rather than just like, man, Kevin Smith. Next time I see him, he better be wearing a silk smoking jacket. Which is really how I want to. I just when I leave here, you're going to be in red silk. That, I'm putting you in red silk in my head right now. Um, I want you to play that character on the talk <laughs> at all times. Man! <laughs> it's much, not much mouth. It's somebody from the Fat Albert from Fat, the Cosby. It kid. sounded Fat Albertarian. A it did. Bit. Did it? Man, you like um, school in the summertime. Before we get there, before we get to the talk, before before you wind up on TV and shit, when do you make the first step? Oh, stand up. So yeah, to the like, you know what? I'm going to jump up and say something that I think is funny. So here's what happened. I moved back to the to the Bay Area. Sam Rockwell. Sam Rockwell floated me up through my periphery. No, I was over him. Um, uh, I was with my husband. Nobody is ever over Sam Rockwell. <laughs> Are you sure? I never will be. The man never. is magic. He is. He's 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 seductive on a on a planetary level. Um, <laughs> I I got I I was I was engaged. I was living in San Francisco. I was working. Um, I don't know if people out there know this, but working sucks. Yeah, it blows. And I was in a cubicle, just walls, walls were closing. What were you doing? What was the job? I was doing job? PR for, it was a good, good job. I was doing PR for a, a green, an environmental company. I wanted to do good things. I wanted to be in the nonprofit world. By the way, nonprofit world, you suck too. I know you're trying to do good stuff, but you hug and you talk too fucking much. Go do something with yourselves. I don't need to talk it out with a guy who has nothing to do with what I do in PR. Why does the finance guy need to weigh in on my report? Anyway, I was buried, buried <laughs> anger. So, um... And I was just unhappy and I didn't understand why because I had like a perfect job and I was happy. Like everything was good and I realized it was because I wasn't performing. How far away were you from getting married at this point? You said you were engaged. Uh, maybe a year. Maybe I'd just gotten engaged. Do you think there was a sense of like, you know, fucking marriage oh, is no. another beast altogether. So let no. me see if I, oh, I want to do, do this something now. Before. It wasn't that it was like everything was perfect. And so I didn't understand why that there was dissatisfaction in my life. And it was just creative dissatisfaction. Like I figured it out. I was like, everything else in my life is working. But you haven't performed in a bit. It was the first time in my life I hadn't been performing. I realized that. I said, what's changed? Just this one thing. I so haven't how been do on you stage. feel? Do you immediately go, oh, I could go take classes or do you go, hey, was, maybe I'll jump up on stage? Kind of like a problem solver. So I was like, what can I do? And imagine you thought this way when you made your first film. I was like, what can I do without knowing anybody or having any money? <laughs> or, or you know what I mean? And I, I was like, I don't I can't start a band. I don't play an instrument. I don't need it. I don't want an agent. I don't want to audition for a play. Stand up was a thing I could just go do. And that comes from my dad. My dad's like, let's go do that shit. But where does the confidence come from to be like, None, I think I, I could be. Fun. It's one thing to be like, arrogance. I know I can stand up on stage in front of people and talk extemporaneously mm -hmm. or otherwise. But it's another thing to be like, I know I can do that. And pull a fucking giggle out of them at the appropriate Right. Moment. No, I don't know that I knew that. But it was right when the precursor to the Comedy Central Network was gone. This network called Ha. Do you remember Ha? Barely. It was yeah, on for like yeah. nine months. And I was watching a lot of that. And I was like, I was watching it. And it was, ser you know, serviceably shitty. And I thought, well, I can do at People least that. Well, brick walls. Yeah, brick walls, blazers, a lot of, bla a lot of felt blazers. Did you ever notice kind of shit? Yeah, exactly. And I thought I could, I could do that. Or at, at least I think I can do that. And I started writing joke ideas down. My husband saw me like writing things. He, he he's, he's he's like, are you cheating on me? He was like, he's just keeping notes on all the sex trysts you had. No, he watched me doing that. And he's, he's such a great guy. He bought me a book 
on like he didn't know what I was doing. Thought I was journaling, so he wrote me. He bought me a book on journaling, That's and he, he's fucking the greatest. He bought me a book on journaling. And he bought me a journal, so I just started writing all these joke ideas down over like six or nine months. And then when I got up the stones, I said, "I want to do stand up. Will you come with me?" And we went to this dump of a club called the Holy City Zoo in San Francisco. And What's it called? The, the Holy, Holy City, City Zoo. Zoo. It's closed. You had to pay to get on stage. I think it was two dollars for three minutes. And, um, <laughs> That's not bad, it's man. Not too bad. It's not too shabby, right? And it was first come, first serve, and um, I'm always tardy. So I uh, was like last. I went like 154. And, you know, it was like a homeless guy, my husband and the bartender. And I got one, like one moderate, moderately genuine laugh out of like the three minutes. Just one. And now it's like, you were I'm like, born oh to do this God. shit. This is, do you smell that? Do you smell what's happening in here right now? Do you feel this washing over you? Follow, <laughs> follow that, no one. And you got that me was excited. It. The, uh, <laughs> it's, it's such an awesome origin story. Did you, let me ask you this. You go up dry. You take a shot before you go. De- sober, definitely sober. Um, I, I never, I never started drinking really during, like I had a period early in my comedy life where I would drink mainly because it was free. Not because I was nervous, but because they give it to you, you could get, it was free. And I, I came up poor and I'll never turn out a free comestible of any kind <laughs> ever. If there's like hors d'oeuvres that are floating back in the kitchen, I will shove them into my pocketbook. <laughs> so, um, so I would used to drink a lot because it was free. And then when I moved to LA, I would especially drink because you get your one free drink. And I was so broke, I was living off my credit cards. Right. And it was like, it was like calories in there. I would get like the most caloric. I would get like a, a Midori sour. Cause it was like the highest was calorie drink. It was <laughs> green and viscous. Um, and then I did what I realized was that I was funnier when I was completely 100% sober, it, which is just, you know how it is. If you're riffing and you still riff when you're buzzed, mm-hmm. but it's a fraction of a second later than if you were sober, right? It just, it just takes your edge off the trade off. I mean, I'm not a boozer, like, I don't like to I, I but am. stoner I am obviously. Mm-hmm. And the trade off there is what you lack in the one second or in the case of stoning, maybe even two seconds <laughs> Possibly of, three. of alacrity you make up for in. I'm going to go for this one. Right. And you right. will tell the fucking joke or, or follow a thread that like yes. normally you might not. You tra- you can train for that. Mm. So I trained for, it, I talk about this a lot. Comedians work very hard to break the barrier. There's like a mind mouth barrier in, in most, in most people, which is you think, then you think about, then you say. Right. There's so a com- filter. Yes. Comedians work very hard to remove the think about and just go from the think to the say. Pull the filter out. Absolutely. So it just drops from brain just to drops mouth. from brain to mouth without you thinking, without you considering. And so you can train, you can just train, you can train for that. And you can train for also, uh, you can train all of the shame out of yourself as well <laughs> so that you just never, ever judge what you're going to say. You just think, I'm going to see if this gets a laugh. That's all that matters. Right. All that matters is, is this going to be funny? It doesn't matter if I'm embarrassed. It doesn't matter if I shame myself or shame others. Is this going to be funny? That is always a litmus test for a comic. And Do you, you have that line? Will you go to that place? Yes. Like I, I, there are places I can't yes. go. Like yes. I'm like, you know what? It ain't worth it for the laugh. Like I don't want to hold on to. I won't be. I'm too nice a guy. I can't do it. Like every not, time I see somebody go like this, the motherfucker said this, right. or this motherfucker said this, <laughs> or this dude fucking said this about the shooting and fucking. Oh yeah, right. Every time I see something like that, I'm like, I can't. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to say something and I'm going to ask you a question because, um, I'm not, I'm definitely not a mean comic. I'm very self deprecating. So most of it is me about too. me telling my own, being on, totally. yeah, beat up on myself. Um, and I, I like to invite the audience in. So we're all on the same side. I'm not a softy, but I just feel like we can all laugh at the same shit. It totally. doesn't have to, I, no, I'm not adversarial, but I do understand the math of comedy and like, I don't know how much I want to say about the truth of this, but there was Onion made a joke during the Oscars about, about the little girl about convention a wallace which and, and the joke was i mean it was they picked the person who was least yes. likely of everyone on the planet involved with the oscars to be what they called her right. they were like who here is so sweet and adorable that saying this about her cannot possibly be true under any circumstances and she just happened to be the person they picked and right. people lost their minds and i remember thinking they shouldn't have done it Mainly because you just you just don't make jokes about kids. You just don't make jokes about kids. Also, it's just like they they're much smarter. They're than smarter that. than that. At the same time, I understood what the math was that got them there, which is we're going to make a joke about someone being a dick. Right. Who's the person who's who's could the never, only one on the on camera, all innocent, unimpeachable, happy to be there, sweetest, most adorable. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like you know calling a like calling a, a toy pony an asshole. You know what I mean? <laughs> um. So. I don't apologize for it. And I don't think it was right to do it because I think it was lazy. But I guess my point is comedy is about bravery. Like great comedy is about bravery. Right. You know what I mean? And about being willing to, but it shouldn't be about laziness. So like somebody like Keith, not Keith Richards. Um, uh, 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 why is it, why doesn't he, you, you've watched every episode of Seinfeld 100 times. Um, oh, uh, Michael, Richards. Michael Richards. When Michael Richards did the thing where he said the N word yeah, a million yeah, times, yeah. It, 
people were saying it was racist. And I, I said, you know, he wasn't. He's just lazy. Yeah. He's not a good comedian. So he wanted to do something shocking, but he didn't have any tools in his tool. He didn't have any tools in his tool belt. So he pulled out the one he had. And it was it happened to be super offensive, right. but more than that, he was just it was just bad comedy. And it was an old tool that just, inappropriate, y- inappropriate tool, tool and, and uh, yeah, not and not, more like a melon. When yeah, you're exactly. For a tool, you're yeah, just exactly. Like, Why did you? Pull I'm gonna this pull out my over? razor, and he's like, "I've pulled out a, a soft chinchilla blanket. I'm gonna flick it at you <laughs> over and over again." Yeah, that was um, a weird one. Man. It was. I mean, you know, when but I first, then again, that's the thing. Like that dude wasn't wasn't was he's he? not a stand-up yeah no, he's like not he a wasn't stand-up. really he's out of his league, out of his comic. He was a comedic actor. If I shouldn't have been up there, quite honestly. I'll so, say I'll say it. Should have been up there in the first place. I guess you could you've done enough time where you can say shit like yeah. that. I always defer to comics. Even though I stand on stage try to be funny, I never consider myself a comic mm-hmm. because it takes balls to go up and put together a routine and be like, This is it, I'm living and dying on these fifteen minutes, five minutes, whatever, forty five minutes, whatever it is. I go up there and go like, somebody asked me a question and then <laughs> yeah. I'll fucking then go. go for yeah. hours. Yeah. But yeah. it, it, re- I mean, as much as like a comic relies on the audience to laugh, mm-hmm. I can't even get started until, <laughs> cause I don't have that kind of like, uh, no, I'm not funny. Like I just need somebody to ask me a question. So, and be like, good in dialogue. Wait, I you mean you are funny. Everybody ha- you know, it, I think extemporaneous conversation is the hardest. It's the hardest to be, it's the hardest way to be funny. Um, because it's new every time, but at the same time, it's, it's much more, it's much easier for comics. Well, we always like to panel. We always like to sit in the chair and not do the, not stay behind the mic. Right. Cause in the chair, every time you get a laugh, it's a delight. Right. Oh, look how funny they are just sitting there being themselves. Right. When you're behind a the mic, they're like, you got three minutes to bust, to break me in half. That's what would scare me. Yeah. Man. The notion of like uh, getting up there and they're like, you got this much time. Go. Right. Right. It's right. just, I can't do that. Like I, it would require me it, half of the set to get to. A punchline right because right, it's right, like right. i gotta tell you this anecdote and it requires <laughs> branching out to these three anecdotes. wait stand by for my powerpoint presentation the first night when you do it one in the morning or whatever the fuck you do your minutes there's not many people there. you get that one good laugh you go home with your man yeah was it electric did you fuck well if i had been when have somebody, we not did, well but i mean that night especially i would imagine it's Hell like no. you just did something fucking that, huge I can't, i'm trying to remember if, if I, i'm him i'm super turned on if i'm you i'm like i'm a goddess <laughs> i think it was like three in the morning by the time we got home and we probably like passed i passed out with like the like post adrenaline relief you know what i mean just like oh that's over um i did do you remember start planning for the next one i did remember you? thinking like i'm gonna do this this is and, th- and now this is what I'm going to do. The, the great thing about the interesting thing about com about comedy is that the first time is the best set you'll ever have because you have no expectations. No matter how poorly it goes, you have nothing to compare it to. So right. any laugh is like a gem, right? Like a ruby fell from your lips into your open palm. Right. And then one thousand sets of you eating shit out of your own hand. And then again another laugh at the end of that. So um, I do remember planning for it, and then I just remember sucking for a really long time. Really? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I didn't did you go suck back to so the badly. Same place over and over again. Yeah, I went all over. I drove all over California. I would go to work at five in the morning, work nine hours, get in a car, drive two hours to do stand up in Sacramento or Fresno or Chico. Or I mean, I you know, I was dedicated. How easy is it to book gigs and shit like that? You work for free. It's very easy. So you just go and be like, hey, can I do a show? Like lots of open mics and showcases and begging for time. And how long are we talking about here? Four Because everyone listening, of course, is like four taking years. their notes. I did it for four years and then I moved to LA. Any expectation whatsoever during the four years where you're like, I want to be on the Tonight Show. No. I want to do this shit. No, I, I just, I remember thinking, I just want to be funny. I just want to be funny enough to make a living at this. Your, my, my expectations changed. My, my, the, the better I did, the better I thought I could do. You know what I mean? So you start to, you conquer a goal and then you read define the scope of what you're going to go after. I mean, it was a period where I was like, I don't care if I'm ever on TV. I don't ever want to be on a sitcom. I remember I literally said to my husband, I don't want to be Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> I remember when I got on Friends, my husband was like, remember that time? <laughs> <laughs> well, then you could walk away going, and now I can now say for a <laughs> I don't want to be Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> be Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> Before we got to Friends, <laughs> though, how many steps? Many steps. From that first Many steps. night when you stepped up to the mic to, to friends, how many, how long are you talking? Four years of touring and making no money and, 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 you know, kind of loving comedy, but hating comedy. Got a comedy tour for a few months, came back to, and I was like, okay, I feel like I'm ready to move to LA. My husband was going to go to law school. So we decided that was the time to move instead of waiting another three years. So we moved here then. Um, and so then he, he to law school here. He went to law school in LA. Yeah. And then several years of, um, and this whole time he's just like, keep going, keep going. Yeah. Oh, he's this, he's does, just, does a, he he's watch it? Is, do you make him laugh? Oh yeah, totally. He's done. He doesn't come to my shows anymore, but for years he did. He would come to my shows. He would take notes. He was like a coach, you know, cause really? he, cause he's hard to make laugh. So like if he likes something, he's he'll like, he's like, that was a really good one. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was just like manna yeah, I, from heaven. I destroyed. I destroyed. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, years of living in a dumpy apartment, you know, getting a cash advance on my credit card to pay my other credit card, you know, right. that kind of thing. Um, and then, uh, and then I got a deal and I got a development deal. That was when you could still get development deals. All that time where you're living hand to mouth, are you, you're just living off of comedy at this point or do you have like, I a had a day job. job. I had a day job. Day job. Uh, I was an advertising executive. And, and even when I first moved here, I, my, my last job in the advertising world, I built a website for the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie. Get out of here. Yes. How cute is that? And look at your geek credentials. Oh, my God. Well. On, on a Mac Plus, essentially. it was. What ah! <laughs> now, when you do that, are you expected to know a shit ton about the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? Or do you just oh, start learning? They, they, give, they give you the window to learn. I was, I, was, I was working with Bandai. I worked on that movie. Bandai was developing a set-top box. Kind of like a really early version of what's that shitty like internet box you can get like in a hotel room? Um, oh, uh, Intelli... Uh, box or something you know it's like a, like a set top box you know i mean you can get on the internet on your television right. and it was priced at like an astronomical like 500 dollars, like a web tv kind yeah of but you know you couldn't do you couldn't play any games on it right. you know what I mean? check your internet <laughs> yeah, exactly you check net. your internet like you know big boxy pixels and um they wanted to sell it at supermarkets and i remember like spending months researching this category i mean like there's no way someone who shops at kmart <laughs> or shops at the fucking ralph's is going to buy a 500 hundred dollar magical box that will get them on the internet on their television <laughs> people are out of your mind you need to Drop this price down to a hundred bucks, right? Or it's the dog again. It's not me. I, I swear. I, I'm like, I'm like, do I have peanut butter I, on my ankle? My, my hands and tongue. Is it a girl here. or a boy? It's a little girl. She's Check working it. very hard to remove whatever salt or residual food item I have on lady my ankle. Loving ladies. Wow, it's it's, it's, it's getting it's getting erotic. You'll notice she's not hitting my. No, feet she's at all. not, and she's assiduous. I mean, she's really thorough. <laughs> she's working away all the way around my ankle. Um, thank <laughs> God we're both married because the use of assiduous. <laughs> Uh, won my heart urkel with breasts and now oh assiduous. my god what a vocabulary <laughs> as well so um i i made a big speech like i was you know, i was just like eager little ad executive and i made this big speech and it was all these japanese i'm sorry this is gonna feel racial but there were all these <laughs> japanese executives in the room uh like from japan not Dutch, japanese american because they would have listened to me and uh <laughs> and they were like oh women and they just like literally dismissed me out of hand and um and that company's out of business so you so were the right there, one. I was right. I Somewhere was right. they're every once in a while they turn on the talk and they're just like. Should have listened to. Yeah, black she girl. was so right. Should have listened to black girl. <laughs> <laughs> My accent's clearly that was like a Latino. <laughs> it it was a little bit. It's kind of more Selena than anything else. <laughs> Um, all right, so you get to a place where you get a deal. Yeah, so I got a development deal. You know, I mean, I was like, a, a, you know, it was a time when everybody, every comedian was getting like sitcom. We're getting there, aren't we? Right. Uh, uh, where every, every comic was getting a sitcom -y thing, and so I got a sitcom deal, and then, and then that didn't go anywhere. So yeah, but then I got top what soup. A, explain what a deal is to those who are like. Right. So um, they don't give them out anymore. So I'm describing something that doesn't exist. It's true. But, there was uh, a time yeah. when they did. Oh, them. money was falling out of trees yeah. like pussy on Eddie Murphy. So um, uh, there used to be this deal. You know, guys like Seinfeld and Ray Romano. You know, you you had Drew Carey. These guys that were shows were built around their act. Uh, Paul Reiser. You'd get up and you'd develop five to ten minutes that was like your point of view material about your life and your world. And and if someone could see a sitcom in it, you know, you'd get this development deal where they'd pay you. I mean, back in the day, you know, so like a 100, showcase, hundred thousand dollars to keep to you hold to, you to for, hold you like for a, a year. year while they develop a TV show around you. They put some writers on it. You kind of come up with a concept, and I, you know, uh, because it was actually my life and also a big part of my act. It was like you know a lot of romantic comedy iterations of me being married to a white guy. Right. So you know, um, I mean, that was back when there just you know there was no there, there were so few women doing it just and missed on that one too. Yeah. <laughs> It's all lining up, just not for you. It's the tall. I gotta keep remembering, <laughs> Kevin. You will never have been tall. You were always big. She's tall. Um, um, so, so they. So, how long? One year. One year. They're always a year. So, I and I got I got that one, and then did you ever shoot anything? You yeah, I shot a pilot. Well, so I got that one, and then I got Talk Soup. It didn't go, and then I got Talk Soup. So I did Talk Soup for a year, and then I left, and then a little after that, I did Friends. And when I left Friends. Lisa Kudrow had started a production company, so she and I made a pilot together. What was it about? Um, it was called My Life Incorporated. Uh, it was, I'm really proud of it. Um, me, um, uh, so she produced it, but it was me and Richard Kind and Adam like Goldberg nice like and uh, not Lucy Punch. Was it Lucy Punch? Not Lucy Punch. There's a different Lucy, the girl who was in the European office. She's yeah. brilliant. I can't think. Lucy Davis. Um, played my roommate and Amber, Adam played my best friend. And it was about a, a, like I worked in New York and then my company gets bought by a big corporation. So I go from working at kind of like a hip downtown little like boutique design firm to working at like a big corporate like 
And the extra, the like under five extra was, um, uh, farts. What's her name? I have, I have a memory of, uh, a Kristen wig, Get out a of young here. Kristen wig. Really? So she owes me everything by the way. Um, but, uh, and it was great. It was uh, my character and my, and Adam's character were like first and third highest testing characters on any pilot at that network that year. And the show still didn't get picked. <laughs> what network was it? It was at CBS. Um, and Lisa Kudrow, you met her on Friends? Mm-hmm. We met on Friends. She, I love the she's comeback. The, she, oh, she's the greatest. And I love the other she's thing the, she's, she's doing. She's doing web, uh, web therapy. She's so great. Oh, she's, she's so fucking, smart. I was never a Friends person. Mm-hmm. Not like an anti-Friends guy, but I just didn't watch the show. But I... I love her in um, Romy and Michelle. I dig her. I just, I think she's, she's funny as fuck. Banana smart. I mean, she's just like one of the smartest people I've ever worked with. I was on Watch Trending with her a couple of weeks ago. She's great. She, yeah, I've had her on my really show cool. and she's just, she's, you know, she, and I loved working with her. Incredibly smart. I mean, you know, you, you know what this business is like. It, the longer you're in it, what you realize is you have to make, you have to make your, the best thing you've ever made. Over and over and over again. You can't like make a good one, then make a shitty one. You just have to keep making. This is the best effort. I literally broke a bone making this. Yeah. It's probably not going to go. I got to get back in there and break another bone making something else. And um, and when you first get in, you just think, how can people not see how incredible this is? And then what you realize is just, just it's just a sea full of just biting, swimming fishes, and you know your fish is probably going to get eaten alive, ripped ripped apart by four sharks. You feel special, and then you realize there are so many fucking quote unquote special so people much. out there. So many. For as but, many people that don't try it, yeah, there are a lot of people that still try it enough to where if you're not staying current or relevant or doing something that matters. <laughs> you will be forgotten yeah. very, very quickly. Well, and everybody will be forgotten. I mean, it's a machine and it's a planet that turns and yeah. shit gets forgotten. And I think that I, I was just having this conversation with someone else on my show that like what I had to realize what's, what's been good for me. And I think what's kept me engaged this whole time is that it's great to be seen. It's great to make money. I just care about making good shit that at the end of the day, I'm like, Oh, I made that. Because I feel like if every day you're engaged in making shit you're excited about, eventually someone's going to latch onto it. But in the meantime, you're every day you're like, oh, today I got up and I made this fucking awesome thing. Right. And, you know, I've done I've made stuff that I'm like, well, no one's ever going to see this. But I'm like so pleased. I'm just so pleased that I made it. You know, I just I just shot a music video for some friends of mine and uh, it took me forever. I was like, hey, guys, look, I just I, I, I want to shoot more stuff. Can I just come shoot you guys while you're on tour? You know, I'll pay my own way. I just get me a pass so I can go backstage. And I just went on tour with them for two for two dates, shot them all day long. And then it sat on my computer for six months because I was slammed, you know. And then I sat down and I cut it together, and I was like, and "You're like, this ah, is fucking great." Like, is that yeah. how you manage? Because that's that's a real big uh, secret to all of this. If you're gonna do as much as Aisha does, you gotta Poor fucking Kevin. you gotta balance, yeah, like a motherfucker. Yeah, you do. The um I, the familiarity of the story you just told of. Pour my all into it. Sat on my laptop for six months. Yeah. Then rediscovered it and <laughs> fucking brought it home. <laughs> yeah. That's the only way you can do mm-hmm. as many things as possible. It's like your brain kind of goes like periodically people be like, hey, somebody wants this, your attention on this. Mm-hmm. And there's a block in your brain where you're just like, that's not for another week. Yeah. I, this doesn't I'm, exist. I, I can't even me. focus on it now. And and when I was younger, I used to do a lot of like uh, prevaricating and Oh, I'll get it to you. And now I just tell people, you're not, I'm not even, I'm not talking to you until this date. And I'm sorry if I'm like an asshole, but that's what I have for right. you. That's what I have for myself. So this is your window. And then until that happens, like that's not, you're not coming to you. But when you're 25, you're just like, you know, I don't know. I mean, every single thing was the end of the world. Every time, every audition was the audition that was going to make or break me. You know, I have to fly. I remember my husband and I were in Hawaii once for our five year anniversary. And my old manager was like, you have to come back for an audition. You know, I'm like, no, I'd be like, go fuck yourself. Yeah, but then you're but like, then, oh, grab God, your this shit. Is be exactly, pack it up, set this bitch on fire, you know? <laughs> and we like used all our miles we'd accumulated over four years of commuting to college and they were just gone in an instant so I could fly back and audition for like Magic Johnson's comedy roundup at the fucking no. Starbucks. I mean, you know, something of absolute no value whatsoever. Right. But, um, but I also think, you know, when you But hear- there's a love story in there because there's a dude who's like, Okay. Yeah, yeah. Every time. Let's Every jump time. on the plane. He's a monster. Back. He's a he's a giant. And and the the last thing I was saying about that is I think that you 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 see it when I when I was younger, I used to be like, why does you know this writer only turn out one book every decade or why does this filmmaker only make one movie every seven years or 10 years? What's wrong with them? Right. If I was, a, I'd be making a movie every eight, nine, 18 months, every three years. And what you realize is if every effort is going to be your best effort, 
can't do it that. It takes the time it takes. Yeah. It takes the time it takes. And you want to build a body of work that you're going to look back on and be proud of. And so you just can't be cranking. It's got. It's all got to be something that's in that's in you. You know. That's, that's why what, I yeah. stopped. That's why I stepped Have off. You, well, of the I'm going to ask you on my show. You will. No, we'll no, come, you know what? We should show. do that. Let's man. do that now. We're going to head over to Aisha's show, man, Girl on Guy, and continue our discussion. And over there, uh, your your audience is going to be bored to tears because I still want to talk about the show that you're on now. Yeah, and okay, talk I never talk about myself stuff. on my show. So really? They don't, they don't ever hear. But no, I never talk about myself on what my show. What do you show. do? You talk about the Just, other Just I listen to the other person. Sometimes I interject stories about my childhood, but I never talk about current shit. So we'll do we'll it. We'll continue this over there. All right, man. So follow us over. This is, you're hearing this on, what day does your show go on? Tuesday. What's this? What's Tuesday? We go up Tuesday, Tuesday as well. Oh, do you? I okay, do. Well, I was thinking like Sunday before. Crossover. So it'll literally, it'll literally be a crossover. That's kind of dope. Ooh, so when you're fifth. done listening to this, just pop over and download girl on guy and you'll hear the rest of the discussion. Woo. Right on, man. All right. We'll see you over there. But until then, uh, give it up, give it up for my amazing fucking co-host. Scott Moe's going to have a hard time. Slipping in that chair, man. I bet you the dog's not going to like your ankles. Urkel with tits, he is not. (laughs) (laughs) At all. Um, All right, but thank you for being here, man. And I'll go over your show now. Guy on Girl is done. Now we got to go on Guy. Shecky, shut the fuck up. I'm rapping. (laughs) That's going to be Smodcast for this week, man. I'm Kevin Smith. Aisha Tyler. Have a week. How are you take over? Yeah, sweet. So we just jump in and then I cut in a bunch of shit later. Cool. So um, we were just talking on, on uh, well, for people who don't know, if you haven't already listened to Kevin's show on Smodcast, you go listen to his show. That's the first part of the conversation where he would, it, that we're was. doing a crossover, It's man. so exciting. It's a crossover. This is I'm like when of, fucking, uh, when Arnold went to the Facts of Life school. Or for something that people have actually seen in this lifetime, <laughs> when the guys from CSI Vegas went to New York. <laughs> I guess. Well, You're current, man. Crossover? Stop like, showing off your current <laughs> dick, which is like, way bigger <laughs> than mine. I a little current. It's day. not bigger. It's just it's just more modern. More streamlined. <laughs> it's cut. Mine's all saggy. Mine, yeah, mine's been circumcised. Yours is old fashioned, vintage, vintage, cheesy, vintage man. Dick. Oh, well, wash it, please. <laughs> so, um, we were talking about uh, like generating. Like the first question I had for you, and I was going to build up to it, but since we've been talking for an hour, let's just get into it. You said you stopped making films, and I feel like that was circulating in the ether. Like Kevin has stopped making movies, but I didn't believe it. Yeah, yeah. I, I was. It was like saying that I Santa did. Claus wasn't going to bring presents anymore. It so what? The, Why? It, Who? It was exactly Exactly what you were talking about, uh, and, and it feels like we were we just literally were finishing the conversation. People had to make a jump to this podcast. But yeah. Continuing that thought, you got to break a bone each time. You got to barf up a fucking lung. I know there's Every some time. people that sit there and go like, "Dude, you didn't barf up a lung on insert movie here, cop out, Jersey Girl, whatever." Fuck. But it's untrue. Whatever I did, I always poured everything mm-hmm. into man. Mm-hmm. But you can't do that over and over again on an empty tank. Like, no. Everything that I had experienced in my life up until the moment I was like, okay, it's time to make clerks. Right. Fed me for a long fucking time, mm-hmm. but eventually the tank gets empty because yeah. you go from being somebody who's ingesting the world to somebody who's outputting and trying to create shit. And so part of that, the ingestion just stops as it becomes all about output. And, you know, you're not, when you pull your head up, you're like, where am I? Right. Fuck. I mean, right. everyone's over there and stuff like that. Because it's just it's you're you're so busy going like I've got this moment in time like when, when clerks happen man you know I I knew what I wanted to do next because I was like just in case anything cool ever happens right well you foot's spent in the door. every moment up to clerks fantasizing about everything that would happen after uh, when clerks happen and after right it's and it's it was just, small dude yeah. like I was on what's trending last week and Bernie uh, that dude who does red versus blue. Mm-hmm online um he was on and he was talking about like how they put together these machinima videos mm-hmm. and shit and like these cats this generation these youtubers and the kids who are making flicks now are the true independents we were the ones that were like we're a fucking independent film man we'll fuck we're independent fuck you we don't need your money we'll fucking do it ourselves until we were done they were like can, can you buy this yeah exactly because please. we need your money yeah we need the money and then you're not independent you're right. part of the fucking machine this generation of, of creators has gone like, look, we're not even going to go half ever, hand. Ever, ever. There's no need. You they know, don't we, need to go to a network or a film studio and be like, can I have? They'll figure it out themselves. Well, and the guys like the, guy, the Red versus Blue or any of these guys like uh, Tobuscus and these guys that are making these things. Some of these guys are pouring out a, yeah, a million dollars a year. Ray in Ray William Rabbit. Johnson, yes. man. Just on the, and I, I'm not judging any. I think Red versus Blue actually, is, they're be- beautifully produced. Um, Toby, who I, Toby Turner, who I think is an adorable guy and I love what he does. I mean, this is not elevated filmmaking. You but know what I mean? it doesn't matter. Does, That's you know, the thing. Yeah. It's like, and if you think about the indie film movement in the late 80s, early 90s, it was also people going, 
this is an elevated cinema because right. it all looked like story. shit. It was about yeah. the content. Yeah. And once again, the generation that watched that shit go, oh, it is about the content. Mm -hmm. So you can sit there and go, like, I'm going to play a video game and put voices in it. Mm -hmm. And that's going to become something real, right. legitimate. Right. Like in a world where people go, like, I don't get it. Anybody can do that. It's like, well, yeah, that's yeah. the point. But we did it first. Yeah. And now others will kind of follow. And so when you fucking play it all out, I mean, no matter what you do, you put everything into it. You get to a point where you're tapped. Yeah. You where well, you're tapped. Like, and, and, and I think also if you have any level of and not, not, any level of success um, where you're able to sit back and examine what you've put out there and you're not in that period of abject panic that most of us are in for a good part of our career, which is like, I got to keep working, got to keep working for, right. for fear of obsolescence or also uh, starvation. Right. Um, where you get to the point where you can say, I don't want to do those things. If, the, if you don't have a story in you, then why put yourself through it? Why make some shit other people want you to make that, you know, because if you can't get a boner for your own shit, how are you going to get a boner for like this other piece of crap that somebody brought you? Bingo. Yeah. I looked at it like this, man. Like at the end of the day, um, all I am are the stories that I got. Like that's my only currency in this life. And film afforded me that a voice gave me a platform. Let me fucking not be a guy to work with his hands for a mm -hmm. living. Film has given me everything mm -hmm. that I have in this life at this point. Uh, I met my beautiful wife because she interviewed me because I made a fucking dopey movie or two. I got a kid with her because I made those movies and stuff. I live in a beautiful fucking house that I bought from Ben Affleck because these all this shit because of the movies and because of film. Mm -hmm. And the love of film happened when I saw Slacker and said, oh my God, like this is possible? Right. Like you could just tell a story and you don't have to be from New York or LA and it doesn't have to have famous people and it mm -hmm. doesn't need three acts. And right. this right. is a movie that doesn't even have the same character. You're just training a character every sequence. Right. And it's just fascinating to me. And this dude, you know, I wasn't very, uh, I didn't go to dark mouth. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when I saw that it was like uh, Slacker is made in Austin, Texas, I was like, this guy didn't make his movie in New in York Hollywood. or Hollywood. He made it in Bumblefuck, Nowheresville, Texas. Austin, of course, is the capital <laughs> not, of Texas. Not so bumbly, and, but not still. Not bumbly, an arts, <laughs> arts capital as well. But had I known that, mm -hmm. I never would have tried it because I would have right. been like, oh, well, of course, he right. lives in Austin. Like, Austin would have become a touchstone like New York or L.A. Right. So I see that movie and I go, I want to, that empowers me. It makes me go, and, and this, it always sounds shitty and I don't mean it this way. I saw Slacker and said, Shit, if this counts, I want to do it. Yeah, yeah, And it's yeah. not like me going, that movie sucked. That's me going, this was a dude from nowhere who's, who didn't wait for a go sign or a handout. He wasn't born into the business. He has no movie stars. Right. He's a guy, as far as I could tell, because we didn't have the internet then. And, you know, I read a, a, a an article in the Village yeah. Voice or something like that. As far as I could tell, he was a guy not all that dissimilar from me. Mm -hmm. And if he could do it, why couldn't I do I it? I don't even think you have to apologize for, for the hubris that is required to undertake the massive effort that is needed to make a film. You need it a, is, It's anything. Anything to get up in front of people and say, here's what I think. Yes. Here's what I do. It requires, I've always felt, a mixture of, of, of what I call a, of, a responsible – no, fuck, what is the term I always use? A – Fuck it'll it, fuck. That, this is why I've this is it away. this is you smoked it. Poof. A reasonable amount yes. of unreasonability. Yes, absolutely. It's unreasonable to be like, oh, I'm gonna make a movie, or people are gonna give a shit about yes. what I say or yes. think or something like that. Yeah. So a healthy, uh, you know, never be unreasonable to the point of I'm gonna leap off the Irrational. roof and fly. Yeah, that's irrationality. Mm -hmm. But you can be unreasonable. Mm -hmm. You have to be to make some art yeah. because. It, it it requires unreasonability. There's duality there too because I feel like you need to be. Uh, I don't want to use the word egotistical, so let's just say to have the hubris to to, to that drives bravery, right? right? That I've got something important to say and people need to see it. But the, the side, other side that you need is the idea that's like if I'm going to put this much energy in something, I've got to make it great. It can't. I can't. It can't be a layup. It's got to right. be something I really invest my time and energy to. You want to you be know? through the door first. Yes. Like any. Like I, I love comic book movies, and I'll watch them from now until the end of time. People are like you love comic books. You should make a fucking comic book movie, and I'm like, no, I shouldn't because I love watching them and talking about them. But yeah. I've never had an interest in making one. Like right. that's a specialized art and. Not for nothing, but we don't need one more guy telling one more story about one more guy <laughs> whose fucking parents got killed and he's so mad at the world he's got to put on a mask and beat up bad guys. Like anybody can tell that right. story. And people with far more talent than I 
can make a really fucking beautiful version of that. Although like I no one like, on the Dark Knight, but I don't. I feel like Kick Ass. Kick Ass is in your constellation. But I wouldn't have done it. Like when yeah. I saw Kick Out, Kick Ass, like I, I could sit there and go, oh, I would have trimmed that or I would have changed that. But yeah. that never would have occurred. Because you me. never wouldn't. You like yeah, like on, on its whole, it's not the story that would like. Have there was one it. moment in time before we made Jane Silent Bob Strike Back where I was like, hey man, maybe it'd be fun to do a whole. Blunt Man and Chronic movie with him and I running around Jason Mewes, running around yeah. in costume and yeah. fucking doing superhero shtick. And then I was like, you know what? That'll be a tiny sequence in the middle of a movie. Yeah. Rather. Yeah. Rather than an entire. But movie. I loved I loved film so much. It fucking gave me everything. It was the lady in the lake, man. It was uh, it was the giving tree. I think yeah. about that Shel Silverstein book. Always made me cry when I was a kid. And the kid who keeps coming That's back to sweet. tree and like, I fucking need oh, this. Yeah. I need this. I need it. And the tree is given everything. 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 And at the end, there's the nothing tree, left. Nothing. He even cuts the tree down, makes a boat. Get the fucking what away from dick. the world. Oh, this guy's the worst. <laughs> the biggest mooch on the planet. The worst boyfriend anybody's ever had. Um, and then one day he arrives old and he's like, you know, I, the tree's like, I can't give you. I don't have anything left to give you. I've given you everything I have. And the guy's like, well, I just need to sit down. So he sits on the stump and shit like that. I always felt that film was kind of like that. It was like the giving tree. Everything I got, I got from it. And then one day I realized that I was using it like an ATM, like mm -hmm. it was what paid my bills. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't making a film because I was like, if I don't tell this story, I'm going to fucking die. Mm -hmm. I was like, if I don't tell this story, well, I don't pay my bills. And mm -hmm. if I don't tell it, I'll tell another story because mm -hmm. this is what I do for a living. And people mm -hmm. give me money to make pretend. You become acclimated to it, comfortable with mm -hmm. it. And suddenly the lady of your, the love of your life becomes this horror that you're just like, trick me out man and not even the horror that you're like i'm paying her money to use myself i'm like go out and earn for me yeah i'm a pimp at that point and and i didn't start as a guy who's like i'm gonna sell my fucking art yes of course i want to sell my art and live commercially and it was in a way where i don't have to work with my hands for a living but i don't want to get on a treadmill where it's like i gotta make some fucking art quick to right. pay my fucking bills right. that was never part of the plan and when you get deep into a life that you didn't ever see coming this wasn't planned i just wanted to make Clerks, I was like that Bernie guy. I wanted to make something, and maybe somebody would see it, and maybe in the future, next time around, they'd give me money to make something right. else so I didn't have to pay for it. Right. So all of this is like, what the fuck? So it, it went very, very well, but at the same time, like, you know, you, you become maybe not, it's not so much I'm accustomed to a certain lifestyle. But, like, you're going to live out in Los Angeles, man. you got to be earning on a regular basis. It's yeah. one of the most expensive fucking places on also, earth. Also, you come to a point in your life where you're accustomed to living a certain way. Um, mm -hmm. And then you add a kid uh, and fucking mouths and shit like that. And mouths. suddenly you're like, all right, man, i got to fucking pay bills with my art. Mm -hmm. And before it was the luxury of, I'm going to make some art and sell my art. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, well, you better go to work because that's what you do. And I had to unplug from that because I was like, fuck it, I'm treating it like an ATM. Like, that thing I love more than anything in the world was being corrupted by a base need of like, I have to survive. So I was like, unplug and figure out anything else. Like it became, movie money became heroin, where it's right. just like, I can't put it down. Right. And I was like, break it, break the chain and figure out how to put it down. Because one day, because we're also talking about like, it was right after the economy started yeah, I was going to say, what was the moment though? Like, was there, was there like a... Zach and Mary was the moment for me where I was like, fuck, shit's not fun anymore. Oh, um, during the film or yeah, after? Yeah, making the movie. And and I loved uh, making the movie. It wasn't I loved like that there was, movie. I love it too. It wasn't like anybody was shitty on it or something like that, but... Clerks 2 always felt like the last good time where everybody mm -hmm. was in it for the fucking love and shit like that. And that to me is when you're at your best. If you mm -hmm. look at any of my shit I've done, the ones you tend to like the most are the ones I have the least money to do. Mm -hmm. So they're made with the most fucking heart, right. passion, all that shit. Right. Zack and Miri is a movie that's made with a healthy $25, $30 million budget and shit yeah. like that. Everyone got paid and, right. you know, very right. well and shit. So, and, and if there was ever a problem, you, know, you just threw money at it to solve right. the problem. Right. And so... I look at Zach and Mary and I dig it. I think it's very funny and I don't mean to put it down or, or diss it by any stretch of the imagination, but it's Kevin Smith doing Judd Apatow doing Kevin Smith. It's mm. Kevin Smith going, oh, the shit I used to do is fucking Got popular. popular? <laughs> well, I could do this in my fucking sleep. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, that's not true. I mean, I look, maybe I can do it in my sleep, but like there's different circumstances. When you've got Universal behind you, mm -hmm. they know how to fucking open comedy. Right, I right. I was at a place, maybe not so much. And I'm not saying like it was their fucking fault. Like the title was kind of difficult to get on TV. We found later on, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you know, some people tell you it's just not as good as a fucking Judd Apatow movie for whatever reason. The movie didn't connect in the way that we were kind of hoping at the box office. Right. But even before that, when we were making the flick, I was just like, 
you know, I'm glad everyone's getting paid and shit, mm-hmm. but like, and I was getting paid. Don't get me wrong. I was mm-hmm. getting paid fucking health days. The most I ever got paid to make a movie. But there's something about you got to be uncomfortable to make art, man. Right. It's like we were right. talking about being a stand up. It's like you got to be willing to go to that place where you're like, I'm just going for the fucking laugh. Yeah. Like, I, I'm sorry. It may hurt your feelings. It may ultimately fucking tarnish my soul. But like in the moment, there's one goal and one goal only. Yeah. Same yeah. thing with 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 anything else or with that. Well, and to transcend too. It's like you know, it, it, this is not a new idea, but you know, the idea that if you didn't offend someone, if in a comedy space, if you didn't offend someone in the room, you didn't do your job, right. right? You're not you're not there to break people, but you're there to tell the truth, right? And if you don't feel the kind of the urgency that will make you say what needs to be said or do what needs to be done, you don't have that urgency. It's hard to do something impactful. You, you know, everyone can go. Eh. I mean, you know, I say like if you if everybody liked it, if everybody liked it. Like, eh. Uh-huh. Right. You know what I mean? Well, you wanted to polarize the shit out of the room. 50% loved you, 50% hated you, but everybody was talking about it. Right. If you get to the point where you're like, you know, or if you feel, yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, then, I mean, yeah. That, yeah. You get to a point where you look at it and you're just like, um, I, well, did the kid who saw Slacker in the Angelica cinema at age 21 on his 21st birthday, mm-hmm. that magical August 2nd, 1991, when fucking lightning struck and suddenly Shazam, I was Captain Marvel because I was like, I have an idea. Mm-hmm. I want to do something. So right. I didn't know what I wanted to do. That kid never th- foresaw Jersey Girl. Yeah. Yeah. He never foresaw Zach and Mary make a porno. Mm-hmm. Like, I. There was something I didn't realize until later on. I didn't like making movies because it was like, oh, shit, like I'm, I get paid money or I, I like now we're fucking famous or we can mm-hmm. do what we want or mm-hmm. I don't have to go to my aunt fucking Barbara's house if I don't want to <laughs> or any of those reasons. Like really at the end of the day, it was being through the door first. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I, I could never be a fireman, but there's something about the aspect of going through the door first. Mm-hmm. That's and and yet like whenever I talk to cops and they're like, hey man, you gotta go through the door first, like on the job. I'm like, mm-hmm. Jesus, that's why yeah. I'll never be a cop because there are bullets on the other side of your door. <laughs> exactly. But like doing something first, that's what meant something. Mm-hmm. So like when you when you're like I, and I'm not saying I'm a fucking trailblazer, but I did blaze a, a path, and it's tough to then just follow a fucking path. Right. Right. Like you yearn to be fucking like you know like there's a scene I always refer to it, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Where they're auditioning to to protect the train from train robbers mm-hmm. and shit, and so mm-hmm. the guy's like, "I got to see you shoot, hit that can," and so Sundance has his gun out and and he's not allowed to draw and he's just firing. He can't hit the can. The guy goes, "You're terrible." He starts walking away. And he's like, "Can I move?" And he goes, "What?" And he goes, "Can I move?" And he goes, "I like, guess." And so he draws and fucking just hits the can multiple times yeah. and shit like that. When there are the even the constraints of freedom. Are, and this sounds like such a first no, world but, uh, fucking thing to exactly say, but even what, the constraints yeah. of freedom, you know, are constraints. Like they you are can't constraints. move. Well, and here's the thing. I mean, and you there ought are some to know literal... you're on fucking network television. Yeah. yeah. And... and I mean, there, there are some literal specific changes that happen when in success mm. that, and, and myself out of the equation, filmmaking, when you're making a movie for no money, everybody leaves you alone. I don't know if you heard the story. It's one of my favorite stories. It's, um, it's it Sonnenberg, uh, Barry Sonnenberg. Uh, directed Ben of Black? Barry Sonnenfeld. Sonnenfeld. Whoa, sorry about that. All people whose names are either Sonnenfeld or Sonnenfeld. <laughs> so Barry Sonnenfeld is making the first Men of Black. And it's like, it's not a, a tiny movie, but it's not a huge new movie considering who's in it. It's Will right. Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. And it's, it's I think it's Fox. Probably the and, lowest of all the budgets. Yeah, right. Maybe maybe it was like 20, 18, 20. Maybe, let's say it was even 30. It was healthier. I think 30, it was probably right? 50. Because it, it still had Steven a, Spielberg's name that's behind right. it. No, no, no movie gets made for fucking I, less than 50. I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say for, this, for, the, for the purposes of the story, 30, 35. Okay. Because I feel, I feel Don't like, I feel like. Audience. That's I, well, not it. They, they, it was higher. They don't know how to use the internet. So, um, so they, they make the movie and well, like relatively. They made this movie for twenty eight thousand dollars, kids. Uh, Sonnenfeld maxed out his credit cards. <laughs> Will Smith emptied his pockets, and most of the money was in his pockets. So he just paid for it out of what was in his in his jacket pockets. So they make the movie, you know, relatively unimpeded, and then it's this massive hit, mm. right? And kind of a surprise hit. Like I think it was. It almost felt like it was going to be this little cult. It wasn't kind of based side on movie. a comic book that was all yeah. that popular. No one and knew it. Was it. From a small comic. And no imprint. one was doing comic book adaptations at the time other than Superman. There wasn't this like pro Comics like, had died because Batman and Robin, I believe, so had happened. Like Joel Schumacher had great success with Batman forever. Batman, the Tim Burton one, did well. Mm-hmm. Batman Returns did less well. They bring on Joel Schumacher. Batman Forever does very well. Has Jim Carrey at right. the height of his powers. Right, right. That's right. Then the next one is Batman and Robin, and it makes like a yeah. hundred, and everyone decides comic book movies are Never over. Except. Work. 
for Men in Black, and but even before them, Blade. Oh yeah, Blade. But New see, Line and again, Blade brought the comic book movie under the radar, right? But you know, very under the radar. Uh, Nobody was going like the comic book movie's back, right? And the reason that Blade worked and continued to work is it never it would never cost a lot of money to make. So right. they had a beautiful, perfect business model there. Make your movie for eight million, ten million, eighteen million dollars. It makes fifty million bucks. You win, you're a winner every fucking time, totally. every time. Sell it overseas. And they put, they did the smart thing. They had a guy who was already a movie star, right. but like who didn't have. But nobody His wanted to work with him. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. That, maybe as well. that too. Um, and he was building some kind of a crazy race army in, in Utah. So um, <laughs> I'm never quite Tarly. sure what happened. With nobody that story. knows. He doesn't even know. So, um, so they make this movie, and it, and obviously it's explosively popular, right. right? Then they go back to make the second one, and now ev- all hands are on deck. Every yeah. person with a suit and a tie is like hovering around craft services, and all hands are Everybody, out. Yeah, too. yeah. Everybody's I got ain't a fucking back idea. Unless I get fucking yeah. paid. So, so then it goes from being. Thir- Fifty million to being like a hundred and twenty million dollar movie, right? I think even more. And, the second right? one was two hundred. See that? God, I'm glad I can't. I I love to make shit up, and you're you're checking me, and I on my I own show. I could be wrong, I'm, but no, I remember I, it being I, way. I guarantee pricey. you, your film your film lore is your film foo is better than my film foo. <laughs> film so um, so he tells this story about he has a heart attack on set. Uh, Sonnenfeld. Barry does. Uh, yes. Okay. And he's in the back of, and the, this is, it's not apocrypha, but I might end up telling this perfectly, but I heard it on, on Fresh Air. He's in the back of the ambulance. He's awake, but you know, he's had this heart attack and he's like strapped to the gurney. And he's like essentially like thinking, I could die. I might die. Right. What does that mean? You know, and, and they're pulling him from set. It's not like he had it at home. He like, took right. him out of video village, right? Exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. He just marked a take and they put him in the back of the ambulance. So he's thinking, like, what does this mean? You know, he goes, well, you know, if I live, you, you know, I'll be able to raise my kids, see my daughter get married, go to college with my wife, and you know, I have this life. To he goes, but if I die, I won't have to finish this film. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, and pretty much it would have been fine either way. Holy crap. You know, and, when, and, yet, and yet, he went back for three. Of course three. he did. Of course. Well, you know, because of the money. You know what I mean? And, I, and, and how can you not? I mean, I, it, it, it's a trap. The yeah. thing is, it's a trap. And every time you hear a story like that or you hear a story about Coppola trying to break his own leg to get off of his own movie, right. you know, you understand that the more success you have, the more people are watching, the more people want something. You're not really making your own film. Yeah. You know, or you're locked in a death battle with the people around you every day. You're fighting about everything, every fucking thing. I had a call today with someone where I was like, I didn't call you to fight. I'm yeah. not interested in fighting with you. And I definitely am not interested in making shit that results in me having to fight with people. And plus, who has the fucking time? Or the energy. And who gives a and fuck? It's a way, and that's the thing. When you multitask like you do and like I do, there's just no time no. for a fucking argument. And no. you, you're not like you tend not to. I'm, I'm not certainly not short with people, but. There are situations I came up here again. This sounds all like first world problems, but well, he walked up here uh, and with swans were carrying his slippers. He was sipping out of a giant bottle of Cristal <laughs> that was being held by P Diddy. By the Hardly. way, it was P Diddy. has been on hard times. He's working here. I came up here yesterday to sh- like I'd said, and, and then his tales told out of school. I won't even say what it is, but I'd done this thing for somebody where they interview you and stuff, and then it had not you know just talking about an old movie as mm-hmm. per usual. Then somebody's like, hey, can you do this additional thing? And you're like, ah, uh, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Then the additional thing turns out to be like a fucking circus. Like with a eat your life. With a script? Where I was just like. Or they handed you some lines to say? Yeah. Oh, no. Goodbye. So I was just like, you know, I'm of an age now where I'm just like, look, like, no. I know nobody in this room is responsible for this, but. It's I just happening. said I was doing somebody a favor. Like, I don't have stock in this company, so <laughs> why am I being handed a script? And right. so how about we do this once, and that's it? Yeah, and, and that like, is actually... two sizes, and I'm like, Oh, well, no, you don't. Aren't you happy you're getting one? You know what Final Cut Pro can do for you? Let Make you lots of sizes. And you feel shitty, because you're just like, again, the 21-year-old sitting in that theater. If right. somebody sat down next to him and said... You know, you're going to be fucking uh, the guy that's just like, you'll get one take and I'm out of here. <laughs> but in that moment, it's like, look, I, I didn't also, sign on for this. No, I signed also, on to be like, hey, this is a cool thing. I'm not a commodity. It. Like, if you, yeah. need, you know, if you need something from me, you can ask for it. But I'm not here to just kind of be done with what you will. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. And, and then also it's like, and, and look, my love's for sale, man. Mm-hmm. If, if it's something I'm into, like I just shot a commercial for this fucking video game. That I absolutely loved. And what I loved even more is the commercial has me and Jay in it. So yeah. I'm like, oh, it's a game I play. 
It's fucking. I get to make a commercial what with him. It? It's Injustice. Ooh, the, I don't in, know it. Oh my god. Is it great? Injustice, God's Among Us. It is fucking phenomenal. You played. Is it? Is it like a new? Is it like a set? You like play two? PS3. You could play. Uh, um, is it great? Um, uh, blah, 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 Xbox. Okay. It is fucking phenomenal. But oh, essentially, it's by the folks that made Mortal Kombat. Oh, okay, fun. And what they did was all every. There's been DC games before where you can fight as Batman and shit oh, yeah. like that mm-hmm. within the Batman world or Batman versus a fucking Mortal Kombat guy. This is the first time you could fight within the DC universe. So heroes fight heroes, villains fight Ooh, villains, vice versa. But the graphics are fucking awesome. And they did this like, this, this is what sold me, man. They showed me the Aquaman video. I was like, I'm fucking in. <laughs> Aqu- Aquaman's special power because everybody's got to fucking hit the two buttons Aquaman's at the right special time. power is calling dolphins. You would think. Because he's always getting a hard time <laughs> on the internet. He's like, dolphins. he's useless. He's fucking he fish star. Makes bubbles. This game found a way to fucking badass him up, man. His special power is you hit his two buttons at the right time and shit. And you use his fucking... Oh. What happens is you're fighting him. And again, it's like a Mortal Kombat yeah. thing. So let's say you're Flash and I'm Aquaman. Okay. Fucking so I'm I, running circles around you. That's all Flash And you are. Do. And you're running a circle around you. And you're hitting me hard. Okay. As, as you, I'm, boom, I'm giving you some boom. lever shots. All right. I catch you. I use my superpower. They zoom in on you. Uh-huh. And you fucking see him like call it in or whatever. A gigantic, and this is the animation on it, a gigantic tidal wave containing boats and fish and fucking <laughs> whales swamp you. Aquaman picks you up with a trident and holds you up underwater, and you see this gigantic great white shark come out of nowhere and fucking eat you. That's brilliant. Right oh, then God. and there, I was just like, A, that I got to like rethink three, Aquaman. That was like three things at once. That it's was fantastic. so great. Every one of the fucking heroes and villains has I thought he was like a ball move. of water. <laughs> you would <laughs> think. He holds it over your face. He whips some goldfish at you. <laughs> it, was, it was astounding. He smashes your face in a chest of doubloons. So I can do, I don't mind fucking selling love for sailing it, man. I'm happy to fucking go out and whore for something. I'm like, I love this. I play right. this. Look, I'm going to talk about it for free anyway. Might as well get paid to right. shoot a commercial. But this other thing was just like, you want me to fucking like, if you want me to sell your product, can I have a piece of your company? Send me, yeah, send me an email. Yeah, because when you, when y'all get rich, uh, you know, I'll just be the fucking guy who got you there. Well, I do feel, I mean, I feel like you become, it's, it's, you lose your independence by virtue of your success. So, yeah. And so that, so that I understand where you look around and you say, my time is not my own. My ideas are not my own. Uh, I'm beholden to people that I don't necessarily want to be beholden to uh, or I'm beholden to an idea of who I am that people expect. I mean, w- w- without putting too fine a point at it or insulting the shit out of you, I feel <laughs> <laughs> I feel like um, like some of the films of yours that I enjoyed most. I actually really love Zach and Mary. Like Dogma, what, Dogma was one of my favorite movies of yours. One of my favorite uh, movies, thanks. period. Thank and you. what I loved about it was I think it was a time in your career where you were making these big, sprawling, big idea movies. Like you were putting – like I feel I like was Dogma 20, was like, – 29. Was a huge, there was a million ideas in that movie. You know what I mean? And a it was, million ideas for $10 million. Like that movie <laughs> yeah. was the only movie I've ever made where – it was more ambitious than its budget. Normally, I just have people sitting around talking to each other, so that yeah. kind of shit is cheap to shoot. And always variations on that. It's just the actors getting paid more or right. you getting paid more. Right. But in Dogma, that was a movie that really could have used. Everyone did it for fucking scale, no fucking right. money and shit like that. I didn't get paid much at all. Um, all the money that we spent is you pull, you, it's in the really movie. up there it's in the, the movie, yeah. And it still needed at least double that because right. it is. It's like heaven, hell, angels, uh, fucking big ideas. But to me, the ideas were what made the movie so exciting, yeah. so electric to watch, so so energizing. And I feel, again, like it's harder the more successful you are to make a movie that ambitious. Yeah. Then people want you, just narrow it down to, you know, to pare it down. And well, Here's the first act or the second act. And everyone likes someone to kiss at the end. You know what I mean? Like, totally. and Even if you're thinking, yeah, let's make it a little, let's make it ugly let's make it a little dirty let's make it a little no 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 no. we're spending this much money now kevin and you know big it's, movie it's, star, just big, a, it's a different business altogether and and what the i mean i don't know how else to say this what they're looking for i just don't i'm not interested in making mm-hmm. they want to make comic book movies dude like right. and, and that's weird for me to say like I, I love comic book movies i just have no like and again this i don't mean this as a diss but anybody could fucking do that right the if only i'm gonna one, do something i want to do something that nobody no one, could no fucking do, do. Yeah. like that's my only currency in this life is i can make a kevin smith movie and nobody else can i've right. seen many people try right right i've seen people appropriate it change it turn it into something way more profitable and better <laughs> but nobody can fucking make a kevin smith movie and that to me is like like the, I'd rather do that, even if I'm doing it for no money or if I'm doing it for somebody's giving me a comfortable budget. I would rather 
if I'm going to go up to bat again, it's going to be me. It's going to be right. fucking something nobody else can do. But to go up to bat with something that, and again, it, it, it's how you present it. It's putting another spoke in the wheel, however you want to say it. But to go up to bat with the same fucking yeah. thing that yeah. anybody can, anybody else can do, it's like why bother? Two questions. Fire. Question one is p- p- pedestrian and mundane. You probably already talked about it, but what what about Avengers? How did you feel about Avengers? I loved Avengers. That was the first superhero movie I saw where I was like, this feels big and new uh, it hit all the points it needed to hit for what they spent and who it was yeah but it was the first time i was like so funny so much smarter I surprising it. it was i saw it on i was in um australia we were doing a jay and silent bob good old tour in australia and we had done a show that night and then it was opening in australia a week before the u.s so we were like fuck we can go see the avengers tonight yeah. so we all went out and saw the show midnight like it's thursday yeah. opening whatever fuck and the first scene in that movie is that fucking Loki pokey stick where he gets the fucking oh, okay, Tetsu okay. dude's chest and all of a sudden yeah, he's like, you're a bad guy. Pew, pew. <laughs> and maybe it was because it was midnight. Maybe because I was like, this is the level of discourse we're looking at. <laughs> like, you know, we had come off of fucking like Iron Man was real smart and all the Marvel movies had been mm-hmm. kind of fucking smart yeah, and plausible pretty, pretty, in a weird way. Yeah. And suddenly, right off the bat, we got a guy making bad guys. There was also some bad. There was like some early bad face acting. Like that first three minutes, bad face acting. I'm making evil face. Yes. I, yeah, 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 yeah. It was, yeah, yeah. It it was, it was I, Honestly, it was the it was a tough opening few minutes. Mm-hmm. That being said, it colored the rest of the movie for me a little bit. And I wasn't. I didn't end it going. I fucking didn't like this. I was just like, yeah, Hulk was cool. The next time I saw it, though, I was completely different. Mm-hmm. Like I was like, you know what? I mean, I guess I'd had a discussion with Scott Mosier. He's like, dude, you'll buy the fucking, I'm so mad I turned into a monster, but you won't buy <laughs> the, guy the magic, stick. magic stick. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, all right, all right, fair I'm enough. so angry, I grew three feet. But that was the comic nerd in me where I was like, dude, that's science. Like Bruce Banner <laughs> <laughs> turning into the Hulk is science. This it's is a magic stick. Yeah, it's like one is based on the Marvel science. So, so I watched it the next time without that bias of like, oh, the fucking stick. It still bristles for me, but I was like, whatever. <laughs> but the movie is wonderful in such a way that I was looking forward to Dark Knight Rises all summer. Like, that was the fucking yeah, movie to be. Yeah. And this one Avengers really snuck Dark in. And fucking, Dark Knight did not do it for me after Avengers at all. It, it's, it's it was a, too joyless. Yeah, well, it is, it, it, it is what it is. A Chris Nolan Batman movie. Yeah. Like, and he likes to make it joyless. And joyless. <laughs> it's not the Avengers. That's the thing. It's like, I, I remember going into the summer... And once I saw the like the Avengers trailer for like right before release, I was mm-hmm. like, "Fuck, man!" Like I think the Avengers could make more money than Dark Knight Rises right. because this is the third iteration of Batman, right? And the second third iteration in twenty years, right? 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 So we've all seen Batman, and this time we've seen, we've seen we've Batman seen Cat- fall and rise and fall and rise and fall and over rise over and over, yes. like the fucking sun and moon and themselves. <laughs> and we've never seen Bane before, but not enough people no, knew him to no, give a nobody shit. Nobody knows who Bane and is. And there was no magical fucking uh, Heath Ledger over the yeah. top Joker performance, right. and the mythos of he died or any of that mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. With Avengers, once that billboard went up on Sunset, where oh, it was yeah. like. Look at all these famous fuckers. Right. Look at look at Scarlett Johansson's ass. They're so colorful. <laughs> They're saving the world. Like you just felt like this Sam is something. Sam Jackson has an eye patch. Even he's there. <laughs> and all your faves are back in one movie. It just felt like, wow, they're giving people something they've never seen and before. And then he used them properly. That is He well. used them properly. And to me... Are you a Buffy guy? Were you a Joss? A no, I wasn't a Joss. I was not a Joss. I'm trying to think of when I... Because I still am not a Buffy person. It wasn't like I went back and consumed it right. afterwards. I mean, I'm trying to think of when I got into Joss. Were you a Fireflyer? Um, I didn't watch the series, but I watched uh, Serenity. On. I mean, I watched the movie. Um, I think so. Maybe then. So going I and mean, I, did, I didn't watch Dollhouse either. What? So you're not even religious about it. You're no. like, oh, he's a good guy. No, yeah, I mean, I like him as a person. I was not a. I'm not a not an anti Joss guy, but I didn't watch. I watched a few episodes of Buffy when we were casting Jay and Bob, and mm-hmm. that's how Eliza got mm-hmm. in the movie. So whatever she was, in, I think the Hellmouth stuff it was mm-hmm. called or something. Hellmouth, Dartmouth, <laughs> Dartmouth. <laughs> um, I th- I think I saw that stuff. I didn't see the Firefly stuff. Um, so I was, I'm not a brown coat or anything yeah. like that. So I kind of went in. I didn't go in with arms crossed like, you fucking impressed me. Because I was right. like, look, they did the smart thing. It's Marvel Moneyball where they're just like, find somebody who knows the genre. Right, who knows this knows world. Knows how to work with effects. Knows right. how to direct a movie. 
Maybe they're coming off of something that didn't do so hot, <laughs> and we get them a little cheaper yeah, for for a price. For a price, yeah. and that's and he, what. And he kills himself to make his. But what? And he also did... the responsibility he's given with that piece as well. I mean, he's no pig in a poke. It's not like fucking. Oh, Joss Whedon couldn't get hired in this right. time. But he was coming off of his last movie was Serenity, which right. made Serenity like did fine. thirty I mean, yeah. million or whatever. Well, here's what here's what he, why I brought it up because I, that's the only film I've seen in that entire universe that I thought this feels other than Kick Ass, which those movies don't count because they're like, you know what I mean? They're like indie rock bands in a, right. in, a in a Rolling Stones world. But that was the movie where I felt like he did what you have done, which is to take a world that's serious with, you know, contextually big ideas and still make it funny and sarcastic and self-aware and without being meta, just, you know, just funny enough. That's what, that, that that's it what seemed Buffy grounded. was. Yeah. It, you know what I mean? And yeah. I, and I, and then looking at that, comparing it to, I mean, we were talking about dogma that what was great about dogma was big ideas, serious consequences, high stakes. So fucking funny. The Avengers and, of religious. Films. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and that, and thank you for, for giving that to me because I'm going to take, it. And I feel like um, versus this kind of somber, either overly earnest execution of comic books, which is just so, so sincere as to be sickeningly treacly. I know, but that makes my dick hard. Oh, uh, everything makes your dick hard. That makes my pussy wet. I love to see. <laughs> well, that's like, probably harder to do. That, not at all. The, t- all you have to do is do Batman well. And for like Chris Nolan, I, I'm, not, I'm not one of these Nolan I, apologists who's like, well, he no, fucking everything he does the is brilliant. Inception was funny. Inception was funny and smart and brilliant and big but ideas. But he's serving a larger master with, with Batman. Like it's not him going, I'm this joyless prick who likes everything dark. He's doing that character. Yeah, so got, all yeah. of us who've loved dark Batman for years. Like mm-hmm. I remember in 1989 seeing Tim Burton's Batman being like, oh shit, this is as dark as it gets. This you, is did fucking you, did insane. Did you get the books? Did you, I mean, I, yeah. was, oh, when I, I was first was like Watchmen, fan. Dark Knight, Watchmen, Dark Knight. That I was, was a huge all I fan, but, yeah. even, but Tim Burton's 89 Batman was like, we'd, we'd only ever had the Adam West Batman. Right, so this right. was like, holy shit, they're finally doing it right. And now when you look at it, you know, it, it comparatively, just cinema, it, it, but that was a very fucking light Batman, it, dusk, very dusky Batman. <laughs> it was a giggle fest compared to like what Nolan does. So if you're a hardcore Batman geek, even if you don't agree with everything he did in like across the movies, although the middle one is fucking nearly perfect, dark, the one with yeah. Heath Ledger. Yeah. You still respect the fact that like nobody else, only Nixon could go to China. Nobody else was ever going to give you and you'll never get it again. The Dark Knight, like a right. Batman who's just like, holy shit. Like, I right, remember that saying week. Batman Begins, and I wasn't even a wild fan of that. I had kind of the same indifference mm-hmm. that I had to Inve- Avengers, and I grew to like that more over time. But I remember seeing it, and people were like, what'd you think? What'd you think? Because I loved 89 Batman was religion to mm-hmm. me. If I had fucking That's hair at all, I would have cut it into my head. A soft little brain. Oh, and, and yeah, right. And still, <laughs> it was just somebody was doing Batman right, and right. fucking Prince did the soundtrack, right, and no, it was, was Mr. Mom was Batman. And, <laughs> <laughs> Nicholson was Joker, and it was everywhere, man. In Times Square, the big bat insignia yeah. was like right up. Like, and comics, finally, you were a comics person, you were like, we're legit. Well, yeah, and finally, someone's making something that represents what we really experience when we read the books instead of this like a little darker pop, pop yeah, candy pow, bam. culture. Yeah, exactly. But when I saw Batman Begins, I was like, well, someone was like, what'd you think? I was like, it's kind of like a cop movie where he just wears a cape. Like, it's <laughs> more of a straight up. I said, right. There's no sense of humor to it, and mm-hmm. it's very earnest, and and blah blah blah. And so by the time he does the next one, you go, oh yeah, fuck, I, this wasn't like, an I accident. Yeah, yeah, this is who he is. This yeah. is what he wants to do. And as a Bat fan, you're like, oh shit, he's giving us the exact fucking Batman we've wanted yeah. for years. He, he he was giving you the books. I mean, the books there was never comedy in the books. But that all being said, and and God bless him, he did a wonderful job. That all being said, you'll never see it silk again. No. They'll rein it in. Batman will be more. Avengers like probably more Iron Man like because yeah, yeah. Iron Man is the template now. Yeah. Look how oh, strong yeah. the Iron Man template is. He's the fucking spine of the Avengers. He's the spine universe, of that whole of all those oh, movies, that entire galaxy, all of them. And he's the same thing. I mean, like even Robert Downey Jr. said it himself at one point. He's bomb- bombing around doing press. I think around the first summer because it was Bat- uh, Iron Man came out and then the Dark Knight mm-hmm. came out later in the summer. And he was like, why does anyone give a shit about Batman? He's so fucking morose. He's going, Tony Stark, he's a playboy. He's fucking he having wore, a good time. He wore a Black Sabbath t-shirt for two-thirds of the movie. It's kind of badass. Genius. It was so fucking But badass. I give that credit to, and I, I, I'm talking about this everywhere lately, it, when it comes up, Iron Man. You, Iron Man comes up more than you would imagine. I think there's this weird renaissance for it, maybe because three is about to happen. Maybe so. He, John Favreau deserves all the fucking credit. I mean, I know there was somebody that hired him, and it's probably Kevin Feige at Marvel who runs the operations over there. 
But they brought in a guy whose like first move was, hey, let's get Robert Downey Jr. Right, right. Because nobody, like, no, not a hero in the slightest. No, and nobody wanted to hire that guy. And right. he was like, maybe he was doing art films, and he was having drug problems a few years prior mm-hmm. and shit like that. But we all knew he could be a great actor. Right. But he was fucking living. TNT or whatever. Right, right, right. And Favreau stands up and goes, I think he's the guy. And yeah. Marvel fights it. I guess Paramount was the financier or co-financier. They're putting the movie out through the them. Family. They and fought it a little bit. Him, Nobody yeah. wanted this. Yeah. And Favreau fought for it. And that's the guy who is your linchpin. Like right. Avengers, I, I, God bless Joss Whedon, without fucking uh, Robert Downey Jr. as right, Iron Man, you right, don't get there. Man. Right, 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 it's right. It's just that he is the fucking he was spine. The, yeah, he was and the, that all comes from like a dude going, I think it's it's this guy. He made an art house choice and they put Gwyneth Paltrow in right, it. Right, right, right. Um, Once fucking, they got a real actor at the center of that movie, everything Suddenly it becomes actor yeah, bait and like yeah. other people who's like, I would never do a movie get in like a, this. Get an iron suit. Give me a break. Think about it. You don't get to Ben Kingsley in the new Iron Man without fucking hiring Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. It may have been like, we'll look back at the ripples of that move for the next 20 years. He's Robert Downey Jr. is fucking like, not, not just back. He was never here. Right, right, like right. This yeah. Before. Never. No, 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 Like he, this is not a Renaissance. This is a Naissance. This is uh, yeah. <laughs> it's otherworldly what has yeah. happened. So, now, but, 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 but no, rightfully if it deserved, can, can, can you, you think of somebody fucking more charming? How than can you have this big of a stiffy for all of this stuff? And not want to make I'm another film. Because I'm a fan, first and foremost. But but don't don't. But I will feel... make another film. I just don't want to make that that kind of film. Don't you? Because I was going to say, I feel like when I am at my most joyful about my work is is when I am deep mired in my own fandom. I right. don't I, because I think that's you know what I mean. Like when I'm like, oh god, this is going to be so fucking awesome. Yes. And I feel like that that when you step away from the work is when you aren't excited about it. But right. you don't n- sound like a guy who's never going to make another movie again. I don't know. See, I, I think like I spent the first 20 years making and now I'm okay to like advocate, to kick back and be like, hey, I saw this thing that was cool. And granted, a lot, a lot of times I'm advocating shit that it's not like, hey, I've discovered this character <laughs> called Batman. <laughs> you know, it's shit that's kind of popular. But every once in a while in there, there's shit that people haven't heard about so much. And all the things that fed me for a while, like now I get to kick back. Like I did a fucking two episodes of this podcast I do called Fat Man on Batman with Grant Morrison. And mm-hmm. one of the things I got to talk about was like, dude, you fed me. You were one of my last meals before my ship set sail. Right. Like that's who I was reading was right. Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol, Animal Man. These were the ideas that were feeding me right before I fucking, you know, launched my fucking ship. Mm-hmm. So it's cool now, like 20 years on, like there's this – loop closing of sorts where like I get to sit down with people that inspired me or pick the brains of people that I've always kind of admired and stuff or sit down with people that I'm like, how did you do it? And I know I've done some cool shit myself, but like I like to hear about fucking somebody else's ascent, if you will. And, and I like to, I don't know, to share that. Like, I think that's the idea behind all the podcasts. I, somewhere behind so it all, many shows. far I mean, too many. It's, it's not like I you went I'm afraid away. I'm going to die. That's it. Yeah, it's I just okay. want to get it all you, out like, as yeah, much yeah, as possible. I mean, you're, you're, you're establishing a legacy. That's okay. Yeah. It's interesting to me because you, uh, just making the one, uh, it's like a pint of blood every week for me. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, I'm doing other stuff, and I know you're doing other stuff. And I, yeah, if I had a job like you, I wouldn't be. I, I wouldn't do this. You know, I would still do this, money, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, it'd be a lot harder. I mean, you're you're like you're not stipulating to the fact that you have an illness, which you do. You have I like don't. A, yeah, you're like I, I don't. But I I mean, I'm honestly, like I've gone to doctors and whatnot, and they're like, well, fucking yeah, lose weight. But no, not a literal that, illness, fine. a mental illness that makes you no. not be able to not work. Oh no, no, not at all. Like I I work like well, I get up and I work. Yeah, that's like what always I have to working. Do. But I know you know what that's tied to. I've told this before. It's a boring story, but tell it one more time my, i used to do one thing i'd get up and i'd make movies and figure out how to make movies write a script sometimes it took you a long time to get that movie made and shit like i remember the days sitting by the phone like a fat boy waiting for a prom date fucking right. waiting for somebody to call yeah. and be like you're got the money go make your art and shit mm-hmm. uh, every once in a while i'd diverge make a comic book or whatever or do q a and stuff and so i hit this place you know after zach and miri and then after southwest airlines as well where i just kind of rebooted and i was like 
look, do everything. My father died, and I, that really informed it. Where, mm-hmm. And I was like, shit, man, I might as well. I'm going to die screaming like my old man one day. I might as well just fucking try to do every everything. dopey thing every I ever. Favreau thing. was on our spoiler show once, and he goes, he put it best. I try to steal it all the time. Sounds like I'm sucking his dick big time, but I love that Iron Man movie. He's a talented guy. He's a good guy. He's a very guy. He said, uh, when you go to the theme park, man, you just want to ride all the rides before they throw you out. And I'm yeah. like, yes, that's, yeah. that's the plan at this yeah. point. And maybe it becomes... At a good time because it's middle age. Maybe this was my version of the middle age crisis. But I just got over. Well, first I shut down. After Zach and Mira, I completely shut down and disengaged for about a month. And not even intentionally. I was scared that I'd get beat up on the internet because Zach and Mira didn't perform. And fucking Seth Rogen had been in such a role. And people were going to be like, only you could fucking ruin <laughs> Seth Rogen's career and shit. So I was like, I can't stand it. Look at it. I yeah. will disengage. And I sat around and I ingested for a while. Yeah. And the shit I ingested... It was weird. I'd kind of left. I picked up where I left off. The same shit I was interested in when I started making films and then started getting paid to make films, I picked up again. Hockey, comic books, fucking Batman, like all the passions that were there before film that I kind of put to the side and have always woven into the films I do. But I fed myself on a steady diet for for a month and kind of came out of it rebooted. Right. And when I came out rebooted, I was just like, do as much as you want stop trying to do one thing and do it well right because everyone in that world that that makes films um they're far more adept at it than you'll ever be i i'm not a great filmmaker i'm a i'm a pretty talented and clever writer and i did figure out how to shoot a movie but i was not a visual stylist telling stories obviously i'm an oralist i'm all oral i you know that. I, I i know you that get about that impression. you i do you i tell. feel that coming off it's, of you. it's coming off the robe um <laughs> You can. I, it's just that's my first language. I've always likened me as a filmmaker to learning two years of Spanish in high school and then going trying to live in Spain mm-hmm. for the next ten years. Mm-hmm. So I'm just like, donde es la zapateria? <laughs> like I didn't know how to tell stories visual. I knew how to tell that clerk story. I right. just set up a camera and let shit happen in front of it. Right. And then one day they're like, "Pwang, you're a filmmaker now." Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how to do that at all. So I had to sit there and learn my craft over the course of twenty years. And whether you whether you're trying to or not, you just keep doing shit over and over. You kind of get better at right. it and shit. So the visual aspect started picking up, but it was always like fucking fighting in mud. If to, to borrow from the Dark Knight Returns, mm-hmm. like it was just a I couldn't swing as effectively. Or to borrow the Butch Cassidy fucking or Sundance analogy, can I move? Yeah. In film, I can't move. In film, there are set rules. That I can't be as fucking limber as I can when I just stand in front of a microphone mm-hmm. or do a podcast or mm-hmm. do a Q&A or take the live podcast on the road or any of right. these other things. So me being a storyteller who likes to just tell a story rather right. than like here are a bunch of pictures that tell right, the story. Right, right, right. If you look at my movies, it's usually people talking to each other. Right. Background doesn't really change. <laughs> we don't do fancy things with the camera work. So for me, I'm wired to have people talk, as you can see. I, yeah. I, it's your show and you haven't fucking spoken in 10 minutes. <laughs> So so that's how I like to do it. And suddenly I found that and I was like, oh, I want to do that. And mm-hmm. that led to like, oh, I want to do this and I want to do this. And I, I think my father dying had a bunch to do with it. Doing it, doing one thing 20 years had a bunch to do with it. Right. But you just get to a point where you're like, there's so many other things I'd rather be doing. Like, I understand the magic of cinema. It'll never go away. And me backing away from it allows me to love it more. Well, and it, it, it I, and I agree. And I think, I mean, it's just there was a moment earlier in the conversation where I felt like – I would not be surprised if one or five or ten years from now, you know, whatever the thing is that's simmering under the surface explodes out again when you've explored but all I these. I could other- do it on TV. Like, yeah. think about it. the movies that I like, the stories I like doing mm-hmm. is this: mm-hmm. two people sitting there talking to each right. other. Doesn't right. really require a lot of money and shit. And right. Back in the day, before the advent of the internet and and where we are currently, um, and before streaming, back when it was like you made a movie, it was in a movie theater, and then it went to home video. Yeah, then it was in a shittier movie theater, and then it went <laughs> and to then home video. Home video. There, was a, there was a chain of command, <laughs> and you went down it. But back then, it was, you know, you there weren't a lot of people doing it. Right. And then I kind of got to do it early, but now, like, there's so many different ways to convey a story. Mm-hmm. And I can... I can rather than waste the money that it takes to tell a movie story, because I, even if you keep your budget low, mm-hmm. you as a production in production, you're still beholden to if you want to advertise it, you're paying the same rates as Batman. You're right. paying the same rates as Men in Black. Like they don't you don't go to a newspaper or a television station and go, I want to run a commercial for my independent film. We don't have a lot of money. So can I pay you a tenth right. of what you would normally get? Right. So at that point, all the shit evens up. So it doesn't matter what you spent on your budget. And that math always drove me nuts where I'm like, 
we we spent five million to make the movie, and you're spending ten million to sell the movie. Mm-hmm. I could have used that ten million in to make movie. a stronger movie. Yeah, exactly. And why we don't you just and we be more? Sold it a different way. And why don't you be more clever about selling the movie yeah, yeah. and not just fucking do spend. the same shit you do for every other film when it doesn't even make any sense and do yeah. it for less. Yeah. So that you get to a point of like ah, I don't I don't want to do it that way anymore, and you realize well the stories I like to tell. I can set up a fucking webcam. I can throw yeah. that shit on YouTube. I can pitch it on television and shoot it there and stuff like that. But it just doesn't require the theatr- the effort that a theatrical film. And when I say effort, don't. It's not me being lazy. It's just oh, no, no, in no, order no, to tell one dopey punishing. story, punishing. Where, not even that, but in order to tell a talky story, yeah. there's an economic way to do it, a more responsible way. That's not like, can I have twenty million dollars, please? Right, right, right. And then on top of that twenty, <laughs> you're going to have to spend another twenty to, to sell it. You right. know, it's just I can convey these thoughts now directly into a microphone like mm-hmm. that that was the frustrating thing like writing something like red state i write it and i have to wait four fucking years to share that idea with everybody right, and right. during that time you're like oh my god i hope nobody does this movie which is right, ridiculous because right. nobody's gonna do that movie but still <laughs> you're like oh my god i hope somebody doesn't do something right. similar something first. similar something that's sim- something similar that works something similar that doesn't work yeah or something doesn't happen in the news or Gilly. That, yeah, i hope god. fucking Gilly doesn't happen to us again right before <laughs> we release you know any of that thing and then if you're doing a podcast, yeah. you sit down in front of a microphone, man, we spill it out, yeah, and we're done. And my best. cool ideas that I'm like, I hope nobody hears it, they heard it right, right. then and there, and right. it's a matter of record. And if somebody else fucking does something similar, there's always someone on the internet who'll be like, this motherfucker did it first. Yeah. Just like yeah. fucking, you'll always hear Simpsons did it first. If if somebody tells a joke remotely similar to you, I got police agents that I don't even pay <laughs> throughout the world who will quickly jump up and be like, somebody did something exactly like you did. So, right. And that's what matters to me. I don't care about the money. And I, well, I got the pussy, so that was sweet. Already. But, <laughs> but I'm, I'm committed to lifelong pussy. So it's not that. What does it for me is going through the fucking door first. Yeah. Being the one who it's like, yeah, if somebody else can do a similar. And, and again, we're not talking about rocket science. We're talking about dick jokes. But it's so <laughs> hard to do something new. Yeah. yeah, it is it's hard. It's so hard to, yeah. to do so- anything new. So mm-hmm. I'll take that. Right. And some people will be like, well, why don't you use your time better and try to cure fucking cancer? Well, I'm not that talented. <laughs> I'm obviously not only talented enough to pull off a, a clever dick joke, somewhat clever. <laughs> but that's why it's not like I'm laser. It's not like I don't want to make film anymore. I love it so much, it's easy to back away. And mm-hmm. I'm. I'm I'm more. I've always been a fiscally responsible storyteller because mm-hmm. I came from the low budget world. Right, and right. And you know what a, you can do with this much money. So then the rest of it just seems like, wait, what? What's happening? It's madness, yeah. man. And it's yeah. just like I'll find a cheaper way to tell the story, and, mm-hmm. and I just keep reducing the budget. And a mm-hmm. podcast is like next to nothing. It, it costs you a little bit because you start putting them up, and the right. more popular it becomes, right? Yeah, you got to pay cost. storage fees yeah. and shit. But still, freedom, baby. Like yeah, you don't. So I, nobody freedom. tells me what to say. I can say whatever the fuck I want. I can literally. I don't have to go to somebody's office and be like, "Okay, the show I want to do is called Fat Man on Batman." It's just me talking about Batman. I don't have to wait for somebody to give me permission. Yeah, to decide whether it's valuable. I don't know. It's really, valuable to me. Check it out and see. I'm going to talk to some give people. Fuck if five people listen. Right. Like I'm excited to do it, and if right. I'm excited to do it, it's going to carry through. Yeah. It's going it's to read so right. passionately. That people who hear it are going to be like, oh, it's a powerful document for change in a dope in a dopey podcast about a stupid <laughs> fictional character. Powerful document for change. When you hear people talk passionately about yeah, something, even does. fucking irrelevant things, mm-hmm. you, it juices you up because mm-hmm. you sit there going, "This is allowed." You can get excited about something right. so ridiculous. Right. And again, we sit here talking and we talk about first world problems of like, oh, I don't want to fucking make movies and shit like that. And people are like, dude, shut up because <laughs> you don't want to fucking <laughs> make French fries. Right. Right. But honestly. I would make fucking French. I came from a convenience store. I don't give a shit about like I don't care how the money gets me. Money right. doesn't is not that material to me. Like I can make it with my mouth, and if it's not through words, I'll put a fucking dick in it, and I'll get money, <laughs> and I'll pay my bills. So I don't care about how I turn the dollar, man. Trick or not, I right. don't give a shit. It's that's not where the love is. Right. That's not what drives me. Right. Like I'll find a way to make money. So you can't sit there and be like, oh, you, you don't want this job. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Because, and not like I want it more than this job, but it's like if I can't give you what I used to give you in mm-hmm. this job, mm-hmm. I don't want to do it anymore. Mm-hmm. It's just like, you know, athletes get to a place where they're like, I can't fucking do what I used to do, man, because right. physically I can't do it. Yeah. 
And I think creative people have the same kind yeah, of no, thing. No, I think the it's The guff gets empty at a certain you point. You have to. Now, one more question before you do self-inflicted wounds. Okay. And it is, uh, you, you brought it up, and it's funny, I forgot about it, but it sounds like in that breath that you mentioned it, that it was pretty seminal in your life, the Southwest thing. Yeah, oh, it was huge. Well, it's so interesting, because I remember in being In retrospect usual- now, it's ridiculous, but in the moment, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me. And really? that shows you what a fucking happy, blessed life I have had. In my head, Kevin, you're um, uh, like just... S- like you don't give a fuck and you're like I casual know. and glib and you're I like, am now. <laughs> oh shit. Any any anything left of the old Kev oh, went on that flight. Sweet. So so I'm I'm sure people have heard this a million times on your show, but no one on my show has heard it. And I don't need you to rehash what happened, <laughs> but I do I am curious about the fact that it seems like it was like this it, like a, like an, a like a period like a piece of, of punctuation. It really was. It was kind of the ending of something and the beginning of something else. And again, with time, because it's been almost like two years at this point, um, it, it's it, I'm very able to be like, fuck, what? And it was more than that now. I think it might actually be three years. Yeah, or something. it feels like it was a long time ago. See, yeah, I think it was like 2009. So, mm-hmm. oh my god, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah it's getting years. further and further away now. Yeah. Just like my flight, as I <laughs> sat on the ground and said, <laughs> I didn't think I was that fat. <laughs> Um, now in retrospect, I should have played it differently, which is so weird because I'm such a fucking marketing whore. Like I know how to sell my fucking pussy like you read about. <laughs> and I was given the biggest opportunity in the world to do that, just yeah. that thing. Yeah. And I couldn't process it. Like Larry King was like, come on my show. And I'd been on Larry King's show once before for Dogma with maybe Chris Rock or something yeah. like that. But here he's like, come on the fucking show, talk about the airline. And I was like, wow, I'm finally getting invited on to Larry King's show. And it's to talk about being fat. Oh. So I was like, as much as I would love to capitalize on this, I, honestly, I w- I, that's only a thought in retrospect. In the yeah. moment, I didn't even think about capitalizing. I was humiliated, man. Yeah. Like, that would, to me was my big secret, right? Like, if they ever find out I'm fat, I'm fucked. <laughs> but everyone knew. But, you know, I just because I put on a heavy coat and wear layers – in your mind, you're camouflaged. And, you know, when you're uh, somewhat successful or even a, a mediocre success like I was, they stop reminding you about your shortcomings because suddenly your shortcomings become your pluses and shit. So and you I don't go think from they being, see them because that's not what people are focused on. Well, you go from being, oh, you fucking fat piece of shit. To, What's up, big guy? Hey, right. big guy. And right. you're big guy for the next 10, 15 years. And then suddenly somebody turns around and goes, uh, you're not big guy, you're fat. Like, so fat that we're going to fucking not let you on this plane. And probably nobody ever would have found out about the incident. But I was so terrified they were going to because I saw people getting on the plane, made eye contact. Like, right. oh, they fucking know who right. I am and shit like right. that. So I figured somebody was going to say something. So I was like, I got to fucking, I got to take control uh, I gotta of this. I got to own this, yeah. And I started, I gotta bang, own bang, it. bang, just tweeting like fucking and crazy. And also you were probably pissed. I was pissed and I was just like, I just wanted to get home. And I was like, fucking, are you shitting me? Yeah. Like, you're out of your fucking mind. And I was still to this day... There's a friend of mine who I fell out with over this fucking incident really? because he was like, you got to stop talking about this. And I was like, get out of your fucking mind. Like, this is not a shtick. Yeah. Like he was like, yeah, he said not, to me, this is not like a, some kind of a thing I'm flogging for he thought it was a bit. He was like, Kevin, if I have to hear you say that you could put the armrest down one more time, like I, I'd rather hear you tell you break the tour, the toilet story again than hear about the armrest. And I said, dude, like you think this is a fucking anecdote, a right. funny anecdote. The only right. reason I'm out there talking about it is because. If I don't, I'm going to fucking slip my wrist. Like, this is the most humiliating thing that ever happened to me. And the only way I could cope with it is to fucking tell that story over and over until it means nothing to me. Right. And he didn't right. see that. And I was just like, you just think this is a fucking bit? You're right. giving me notes on a routine? Right. Like, <laughs> right. we're right. disconnected right now. So yeah. it, was, it was tough. But looking back, I'm like, fuck, man. It wasn't that big a deal. But in the moment, I was like, everybody knows I'm fat. You know why? Because... I flipped the microscope, same shit I tell my kid. And I stole that from Carrie Fisher. One time somebody said to me, and this is not even on, on Twitter, I think it was on the View Askew message board back in the day. Like, I saw Carrie Ooh, Fisher. message board. Message board, <laughs> whiteboard, man, back in the day and shit. Looked like Reddit. I remember going right to Reddit now. and I was like, this looks like my message board. <laughs> Carrie Fisher, uh, somebody had said, Carrie Fisher was doing a Q&A and she said some shit about Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. So I had her email address. Mm-hmm. I was like, who the fuck you think you are saying I can't believe you get to that place in your life right. where the woman who I had a picture next to my bed growing up I wanted to marry Princess Leia yes. I yes. loved her so much and here I'm writing a steamy email but who the fuck do you think you are if I was her I would have been like I'm the fucking princess of the fucking rebellion <laughs> the universe piece of exactly. shit you had me on your sheets <laughs> um, so I you know I wrote her and she goes Kevin you gotta relax man sometimes you gotta spin the microscope away and look and notice how small what you're getting tight about right. is right right 
So I was like, I borrowed that. I always give it to my kid. I was like, you got to step away from the microscope and shit. And in that moment, I super glued the microscope to my fucking eye right. and I couldn't get away from it. And I would right. go, I wouldn't go near the internet cause I was so scared. Um, but I'd walk into my, my bedroom, my wife would be there online and like, um, I'd be like, is it still at the top of the Google news page? And she'd be like, yeah. Uh. And then I'd wake up in the morning and she'd be up already. And I was like, is it still up there? She's like, yeah. I was like, how many articles? She's like 5,000. Uh. And every one of those articles, because I'm in the, in my tweets going, I'm it, right? fat, I'm fat, I'm fat. Every one of them uses the fucking F word right in the headline. Fat director fucking gets mad for being fat. Uh, they, they felt the, the one word, the word that I'm like ducking my whole fucking life. All these people that used to write about me for like doing creative mm-hmm. things, making a movie or shit. Suddenly they were writing. I felt abandoned by the press. Right. They were writing about me as like fat, like put fat in quotes right. in every headline, fat director, blah, blah, blah. The Philadelphia newspaper, the Philadelphia Daily News had a fucking headline. I I still think it's actionable because it didn't include fat in quotes. And it said, picture me, it said blimp landed. Wow. And I was like, Jesus Christ. I I said nothing about being a blimp. So at first I got very, you know, defensive and fucking, you know, make fun of myself and attack at the same time. Which is which is what we all did. I mean, you know, it's. If you're ever, I mean, like, it's, that is the absolute number one outsider defense mechanism. It was what I always did when I was a kid. I make fun of my head. I make fun of my looks. I make fun of my, totally. my race. It's like, I'm going to beat you, you to it. Beat the th- it's called uh, stealing the thunder. Oh, okay. Yeah. But then, but then what happens is, you know, you're right. I mean, unfortunately, it can be feeding that machine. And, in, and I don't know. It's like when it happened, I just thought what happened was wrong. And Kevin is being outspoken about it. I didn't react negatively. I thought he's like, "Fuck you! I'm not going to go quietly into that good night." I it, mean, you know, it that- was I was outraged because I felt fucked over. I honestly, and this is going to sound weird to say, as a fucking very privileged white man, but I felt profiled like yeah. a motherfucker. Yeah. Like, I, like I, I know I'm fat. Like, don't get me wrong. I don't walk around thinking I'm fucking thin, but I'm not what you're saying I right. am. I'm right. not. I know I, I fit in the seat. My belt is buckled. The armrests are down. Like Done. I'm. I'm fat, yes, but I'm not that category fat. And that means something to me. Right. The fact that I could still buckle the fucking belt and put the armrest down on a small commercial plane like a fucking Southwest flight is a badge of honor to a right. guy who carries around some fucking girth, man. It's like if I was ever too big for the fucking seatbelt, that's when I'd be like, right. oh, my shit. Oh, my God. I'm a fat piece of shit. So well, maybe that moment was a wake up call, but it didn't. It wasn't in that way because my weight fluctuates all the time. But I honestly felt fucking profiled and and they lied like that was the thing that busted me the most it burned me i was like you're lying the woman saying to me the pilot wants you to get off the plane i was like well, i know I you're know lying yeah because he can't see me yeah. and i haven't seen him the whole time and i'm right. sitting behind a fucking bulkhead seat right. like and she's like well the plane does have mirrors i was like yeah in the fucking bathroom like yeah. this guy is no way but i can't say this because i don't know if the person next to me is a federal marshal right. who's gonna fucking tase my ass because i don't want to fuck around on a plane after september 11th <laughs> that's why i got off otherwise old me man if it was pre-september 11th yeah i'm like yeah i have to fucking carry my fat ass up this plane <laughs> i paid for this ticket <laughs> but after september 11th i'm just like i've read too many stories about dudes get drunk on a plane a taped to the seat with the fucking duct tape in his mouth Motherfucker stabs you from behind <laughs> going he's crazy he'll kill us all <laughs> so for me at the moment they were like yeah i gave as much as a fight where as i could and i Pro, I hit the lady on a human level. She comes up to me. She's like, you're going to have to get off the plane. And I was like, why? And I thought like, for, I thought my mother had died. I was like, oh, my God, did my mother die? Which made no sense whatsoever. But I couldn't imagine why, why? they would be yeah. pulling me off. And she's like, there's a rule about weight. And I was like, wait. I said, nah, but the armrests are down. The seatbelt's buckled. And she was like, yeah, still, you're going to have to go, you know, because you have people sitting on the other side of you. And I was like, they don't seem to care. I said, ma'am, I turned to the lady next to me. She's like 50. I was like, ma'am, uh, do you care? Am I, am I squishing you? And she goes, it's a short flight, which is not the answer I was looking for. <laughs> I was like, thanks for the fucking support, lady. I turned to the other lady next to me. She's a little grandma type. Shit. She's all wrinkly and whatnot. She looked like she's 80, 85. And I was like, ma'am, am I squishing you? And she's like, what? And I was like, am I squishing you? She's like, what? And I was like, squish. And she goes, I'm fine. And so I was like, see, ma'am, like, yeah, they're fine. And she yeah. goes, yeah, that doesn't matter. You're going to have to come with me. Wow. And I was like, ma'am, please don't do this because there are people who, like, saw me when I got on the plane who know, right. like, who I am. This is fucking humiliating. Right, right, right. And she's like, 
like, I don't know what to tell you. So I get up, and as I turn around, because i got to get my bags on the other side in the overhead compartment. I was the last one on the plane mm-hmm. sitting in the front fucking row. Right. And it's a Southwest flight, so there's no like, hey, man, it's first class. So there's maybe no the people in coach in it. didn't yeah, see it. exactly. Everybody's seeing it. Even if they don't know who the fuck I am, they're like, oh, another fucking fatty got ejected off a plane. Or maybe not, because I don't even know if it was that prevalent at that point. If it was that, like, if they did it a bunch. They, uh, they, I, I'm sure there are people who didn't internalize it. I think that there's something larger here, which is the idea that you've worked very hard for people to, your whole life, one, not just you specifically, but one, but in mm. this case you, to transcend whatever I'm not shortcomings a fat guy. you have, yeah, whatever I'm, shortcomings I'm, you, I believe, may be a fat you believe guy, that you have. But I'm a fat I mean? guy who can make you laugh, I'm, I'm who a I fat can guy. eat I'm, your pussy, who can fuck <laughs> All the things, you know, I've always had to overcome that. People be like, why don't you just lose weight? And it's like, well, it's not that easy. You're a filmmaker and you're an intellectual and you're successful. And and you did all those things on your own steam, on your own effort, Mm -hmm. with a lot of of blood and sweat and fucking sacrifice. And I was in that moment. And then they reduced you to fat guy. Yes. And it would be the same thing. Um, And I know why and how you reacted the way you did, because I can imagine, let's say, being being pulled over and somebody saying to me, you know, flashing a flashlight in my face and saying, "Like, do you have drugs in the car? Yeah. Or wh- where did do you, you want to step out of the car? Where did ma'am? you get? Where did you get this car? Is this your car? Like, I'm driving, you know, my seventy five thousand dollar car, and then someone's saying, "Where did you get this car? Or just like, do I you would not watch. I would the talk. Lo- <laughs> <laughs> I would lose my fucking mind. Yeah. I would lose my mind it, because in that moment, everything that you would it, the worst your worst suspicions of, of other people and how they see you were manifested. And it wasn't just in that moment. It wasn't just the people on the plane." Uh, and the airline and the people at the desk, it just opened the fucking floodgates. Like, I, I, the last allowable bias I feel that you can get away with talking about in public, yeah. where you won't hear, fucking like enrage people or be called a racist or fucking hate monger, is fat. Yeah. They, people go after fat people like you fucking read about, mm-hmm. man. Like, when you see old movies and you fucking see a minorities get picked on, that's what the current climate is. For fat people mm-hmm. in this country, mm-hmm. which baffles me because there are far more of us than fucking you, and we're all bigger. Three, two thirds of this country is overweight. Did you man. see Django? Yeah. Uh, you just made me think of the scene <coughs> where Caprio's like, why don't you all try? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I why guess you're right. <laughs> don't make us, we're jolly now, but if you piss us off, we're going to start eating the fuck out of all of you. Um, and I and I think I, that I is think, it. I think right. weightism is absolutely yeah it is and it, and it it was I, a shitty shitty moment where I was like ew this is what people like, I I believe the best about people yeah. I, I, I not even like I have to because I was raised a fucking Catholic or whatever I, that's just who that's I am see the world. I'm like yeah fucking people are inherently good and yeah of course there are fucking some there's some evil out there and shit but. I think most people are always kind of striving toward the light mm-hmm. rather than fucking like, oh, let's just – well, we're all striving toward what's easy, unfortunately, now. But even while doing that – The light that, is beyond that, I yeah. think. We're trying – we're Still. reaching towards it even if we're not striving Absolutely. for it. Absolutely. And in that moment, like not only were the people in the situation involved, but everybody like who wrote about it, the fucking mm-hmm. press, the fucking people who were in the age of social media who could just weigh in, you know, like who I'd never meet in a million years, but like – Here's my moment, man, and just fucking stabbed at that fucking fat, 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 where you were like, shit, keep stabbing, maybe it'll go away. But instead, they just got through the blubber straight to your fucking heart. So it was was tough. And now, in retrospect, I look back and I'm like, oh my God, like, grow up. Like, I had so many opportunities were handed to me. Like, they were like, fucking Letterman was like, come do the top 10. Right, right. And I was like, no. That was the only thing that I can really keep my head up about the whole situation was, Given that maybe like maybe ultimately it was a fucking test of character or something, given the opportunity to truly hoard out. Because I'll joke about like I'm a whore and I'm always fucking selling shit on Twitter and whatnot. But given a chance to truly fucking whore out on my dignity, mm-hmm. I went another way. Right. Like, and I was happy about that. Like, I didn't go on Larry King. I didn't go on fucking. I hadn't been asked to, uh, to the Daily Show since fucking I made Jane Silent Bob Strike Back and John Stewart was on it. But yeah. sure enough, I got a call about like. Do you want to come be on the show? We'll put you in one of the chairs and blah, blah, blah. And all this shit. And I was like, fuck, man. Like in that moment, now looking back, I'm like, I should have done it all. I should have owned it and just had a good time with it. It was was a wound at the time. I was was in my room, in my office by myself, like fucking crying, not even smoking weed because that makes me happy. I just didn't want to smoke weed. I was just like crying, just fucking like, like, I can't believe people are this shitty. Why did, why did this fucking happen? What did I do wrong? Blah, blah, blah. 
Um, it, it, it was bad. It was, but again, like looking back, that's my lowest. Did that's, you get to a place though where you realize that people are terrible and it had nothing to do with you on some level? That like, no, like, that, like it had everything to do with me. I was the fucking. I, mean, I was it, fat enough for them to no. fucking stand behind and go. His crime is he's not. If it like wasn't us. you, if it wasn't, if it wasn't you, it would have been you know the the guy who got too drunk and was belligerent, or you know fucking Nick Nolte trying to attack a car with a golf club. I mean, right. the internet is a, is a is a tank of piranha. And a meat, a piece of meat falls in, and the piece of meat could have been their fucking brother. And if it, it, it was their brother then, but now it's meat. And it's a cute story too. It's a memeable story of oh, fat guy God, in a yeah. little plane. <laughs> you know, it's cute. It's nobody yeah. got hurt. Nobody yeah. there's no yeah, blood. No lives were at stake. Ultimately, my your, pride your is. Your rage stung. kind of fed it a little bit because it, it, whoever felt badly about it got over that quickly because you were so mad. Then totally. they were like, okay, this guy's got his defenses. Let it go, to. fatty and shit like that right. and whatnot. But, but also, internet, you know, and also, there's a degree of like, it doesn't matter where you came from it doesn't matter if like i ate government cheese growing up and shit like that when you make movies for a living you're perceived as the other yeah. and in that moment i went from being one of everybody to one of the one percent and motherfuckers are like well why don't you ride in a private jet what are you doing on a commercial oh, yeah, airline they, anyway they marlon brando you you know what i mean it's like it's it, kind of shitty where yeah. i was like and again and i felt really mad at the press mostly because i was like i remember talking to a journalist being like Man, like, can't you be out there getting my fucking back? Everyone's yeah. just writing the easy fucking right, story. Right, the absolutely like, easy story. And I, you come to me, and this was, I felt this way about so many of them. I was like, all of you guys come to me, man, when you want something. Like, I'm here for a fucking quote and blah, blah, blah. And then fucking, like, the moment this happens, y'all turn on me and blah. Yeah, users. And then so a friend of mine was just like, Kevin, you seem to think there's the, the same fucking people. <laughs> like, you're in a different <laughs> world dying. now. Yeah, like, there are no more 100 journalists. Like... <laughs> They're, everybody's right, right. writing. Everybody and, and their mother. And you're like, oh, yeah. And you can't. Mm-hmm. And then I, you know, so I kind of made peace with that where I was like, yeah, I guess I couldn't really be mad at, at them. And also, why are they going to get my back? What are you going to write? The story about like, hey, he's a, he's a good, he's fat, but he's a good guy. Leave him alone. Or the story of like, he fucking got caught being fat. That's fucked up. Better yeah. him than me. <laughs> and look how mad he is. And he wrote some funny shit about the island. That was the other thing. Because I was tweeting so comedically, oh, yeah. people are like, oh, he don't care. He's having a that, fucking that, good And that time. was what I said is because you're so smart and you have been so successful and you are so funny. I think people felt like – not that you were exploiting it. I, mean, I think it was unfair of your friend to be like so dismissive. But more just like he's got his hands around it. He's got his hands around it. Yeah. He's dealing with it. He's, he's looking at it. He's talking about it. He doesn't give a shit. Fuck all those people. I had my hands around a crying towel that my <laughs> face was – Buried in, I, and it was miserable. It was like three days. I remember I lived through Benefer, right? And that yeah. what didn't happen to me, but right. I was, you know, you near were on ground the zero. Yes. So yes. We, we took a lot of shrapnel. Um, and I couldn't understand, like, as a fucking Ben Affleck is a stronger person than most people will give, God, ever give him credit for because he fucking took the enmity of everybody. Right. At a certain just point, for living his life. Just for fucking a girl that, like, I don't know any guy wouldn't fucking be like, yeah, I'll fucking, yeah. I'll put suntan lotion oh, on her on a yes. fucking, I will carry in on a your boat, room, on, on your a video. Room. I will put suntan lotion on her boat. And I will dress any way she wants. Like, they gave him shit for like, he stopped wearing jeans and he's wearing cotton pants. <laughs> so they went after this guy left and right, man. And then when the relationship was over, they just fucking beat him and beat oh, yeah. him constantly, which is why like when he's up there getting his award, oh, you're like, good that, for you. Always the best. But still, as they fucking beat that dude down, I would always be like, God, I don't know how I could live through that. Like turning on the fucking computer fu- and seeing 50 articles vitriol. about what a dick you vitriol. are. Vitriol. Yeah, not just dismissive, but like vitriol. Like Total just, yeah, Cruelty, yeah. And then fucking Southwest happened to me and for three days. I I got to know what it was like, like and I was like, holy shit. And the good news is, like, Ben, you survived. Like, you know, it's just like, eh, it's words at the end of the day. And you may feel it a lot because I live a kind of privileged fucking life now and shit, and I don't have to, you know, I don't deal with fucking the world where people are shitty to each other all the time. In my world, even though it's a fake pleasantry, everyone's like, hey, how are you? (laughs) So so good. But like, and there I was exposed to something that most fucking everybody gets exposed to all the time and shit that I know as a fat guy and a fat boy, I was exposed to my whole fucking life. And it had gone away for a while. And that moment was a reminder of like, oh, that still exists. Like, you'll never run that down. It's like I could... I, it doesn't matter. One, I, I could, I, this will never happen because I ain't into the shit, but I could stand there and win a fucking best picture and shit. And to somebody, you'll always be like, oh, fuck that fat piece of shit. Who's he fucking think he is? Like, you know what it's like. Yeah, but There's a bunch of people who always be like, who always. the fuck do you think always. you are? And oh, if you yes. can add something to it, like, oh, yeah. is one, like, look, even somebody like Affleck, who's good looking and smart and charming, gets people going, who the fuck do you think you are? 
So when you don't look the part of somebody up front and you're just, you know, fucking, I got bigger tits than fucking you, you get a lot of, who the fuck do you think you are? Like yeah. people being real aggressively dismissive right. of right. you wanting something a little better for yourself. Right. Something that you're average. willing to work for too, not something you're, not you're asking to buy for it a or, handout. Or yeah. Steal yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Crazy the enmity out there sometimes. Well, and the- I saw a lot of it then. And then it all like fuck it, three days it was the worst, man. And then Tiger Woods came out and said, I cheated on my wife. Tiger Woods pulled a tampon out of a waitress and flung it into a bush. And everybody forgot I was fat. <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. The moment he that golf and some bitch came out and said, I'm cheating. Everybody well, was like, was, Fuck the fat right. guy. <laughs> this guy's really famous. And so for three days I went through hell. And then at the end of three days, when everyone, when he became the top story, I, I fucking dropped way down the Google news page, and suddenly, I was breathing again, and I was like, yeah. "Oh my god, I sur-. Like it was, That's it was right. literally like being in the midst of a maelstrom, and then the maelstrom passed, and I didn't have to live with it for like months. Like Ben had to live with it for a long fucking time, and shouldn't climb his way out of it. It hit hard, like mm-hmm. like a sinkhole, as yeah. we were talking about in the other podcast, yes. and then just as quickly was gone and luckily I was able to climb out of the sinkhole and I do in retrospect look back and go like oh, I could have handled that better and not better in the way of like you know I shouldn't have been a shitty on on Twitter no that was the good part that was fun and and I what I thought was like oh I'm the little guy and I got caught I caught the big guy fucking over the little guy and I forgot right. that I'm the big guy <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, hey, the big guy fucked over the little guy. And they're like, you ain't the little guy <laughs> at all. And so I thought the story was fucking like, hey, man, I caught an airline being shitty. Right. And since I got a platform, and they're I can shitty, talk about And they're it. shitty to everyone no matter what. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're and equal hey, opportunity. Yeah, exactly. Shitty. And they were like, no, you're, you know, they that just That wasn't the story. The being, story was yeah. fat guy in a little plane. <laughs> and I should have seen that as a guy who makes jokes for a living, but I didn't see it, man. So, you know, in, in retrospect, I wish I played it differently. But it was definitely a defining moment. And and it was also empowering as fuck because if you can live through your – that was my worst nightmare. Well, I mean, of course, my worst nightmare is something fucking happening and my wife and kids or – let's be honest, me first and <laughs> foremost. But if you – but if I can live through something that's like, oh, my worst nightmare, relatively speaking, the whole world going, you fat piece of shit was it. And at the right. end of the day, after the whole world got it out of their system – Everything went back to normal. Like it yeah. didn't change. It wasn't suddenly like we don't care about you now that you're fat. I changed, right? Because suddenly I was like, oh, I don't trust a lot of these people anymore. Right, like, right. And, and not in a way of like batting down the hatches. I'm in it all about me. In fact, I became more externalized. I think after that, that's why I started going out and doing the podcast live on the road because I couldn't fly. Didn't want to be near an airport. Right. So that somebody would take. I saw a fucking paparazzi website was like. Uh, bounty five thousand dollars for a picture of Kevin Smith in an airport. What? Yeah, and then it was oh ten thousand if he's sitting in a little chair uh, eating a sandwich. I was like, Fuck. "Come on!" So for, I didn't Do want to go just near. Take that picture and put it on your own. Why didn't website? I Peter Parker it, man? <laughs> yes. Like, why didn't I take my own picture and be <laughs> and like, 10, "I got thousand dollars." I could have like good, did a good angle where I looked fat but not too fat. No, yes. Yeah, I could have prepped it. Side muscular. I wasn't thinking at the time. So, so now, like in retrospect, I you know I realized shit. I could have. I could have been a lot cooler about it, but it took me different places. Like without that incident, Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever would have taken the podcasts on the road. Like me and Mosier did Smodcast. We've been doing it for six years now. First two years, we would muse because, you know, I get up on stage to Mm Q&A. We'd muse about like, hey, man, imagine fucking, you know, we did Smodcast in front of people. And he was like, I could never in a million years, blah, blah, blah. And then one day because I couldn't go near the airport and shit, I was like, I got to get to a bunch of stand-up gigs, Q&A mm-hmm. gigs. Mm-hmm. So I was like, maybe I can rent a bus. Like fucking, you know, Partridge family had a yeah. bus and like yeah. concert people rent buses. And I called up this bus place and I was like, hey man, do you, can you rent a bus for a few gigs out in Texas from Los Angeles to Texas? And they were like, yeah, how many people on your party? I was like, just one. It was a long beat and the guy goes, are you that too fat to fly guy? <gasps> No. <laughs> I was like, I am that guy. No. And he goes, oh, you're going to love traveling on a bus. Oh, and so I my rented God. my first bus and I went to those two gigs. One was in uh, Austin. I think the other was in Dallas. And when I was driving back, I was like, this is fucking awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. I was like, I can smoke weed in the oh, back of this bus. Fuck yeah, you're like a rock star. I felt you're a like, rock star. You're I literally back. felt like a rock got your, star. Got your console out. You got your Xbox. I could have played games. Satellite. I brought a flashlight with me. So oh. I was tagging that shit every few miles. <laughs> I was the miles. lord of my own manner. Nobody was around to judge me. <laughs> but on the back, in the back of the bus, I'm sitting there going, fuck, this would be better if I had friends with me and shit. Mm-hmm. So when I got home, 
Scott Mosier, who I'd done some podcasts with and he was my producer in, in real life and stuff on a lot of the movies we did, he was at a point where he was like, hey, man, like uh, I got, I'm trying to figure out how to make some loot. He had some bills to pay. And I was like, all right, well, dude, I was just thinking. I was out there doing Q&A, and I rented a bus. It was fucking fun. You want to rent a bus, and then we'll just go do Q&A across, you know, not Q&A, it's Modcast across mm-hmm. the country, like do a few gigs and shit, try it out. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah. And, you know, I was up to, doing the Q&A as I was getting pretty fucking healthy. You know, I built up to a nice fucking appearance fee. Mm-hmm. But when you start talking to people like me and my friend are just going to sit there and talk to each other. You know, most yeah. clubs are like, we'll pay you uh, a thousand bucks. Yeah, like, no. And so, but at that point, I'm like, well, we're building something here. Right. So, so and also, well, I guess you were doing the podcast for free from here anyway. So then, totally. Yeah. So it was like, let's see if we could do it. And so, is because of Southwest, I got on the bus in the first place. And because I was on the bus, I was like, hey, Moj, maybe we can take Smodcast on the road. Mm-hmm. And we did. We took it on a tour, and suddenly we were podcasting live. And then now a lot of people do that and shit. Back then, weren't it was too many. Yeah. You know, it wasn't going on. So when that happened, I came back from that first tour. I was like, I fucking love doing live podcasts. It's better than doing a Q&A because I'm sitting there talking to somebody, mm-hmm. man, tag team. And this is great. And I became obsessed with the idea of like, I want to get a little black box theater and we could do it all the time. We mm-hmm. could have performances all we want. So we found a space uh, on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard. Matt Cohen, my friend, he found it. And we opened up Smodcastle. Mm-hmm. And so the idea was we'd do Smodcast there every week, a live version for people and, and stuff, and then maybe other shows or who knows. But it was just a little performance space. Never had that. Didn't do the college thing to its mm-hmm. extent. So I never had the, let's be experimental in this fucking stage area, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So we start doing shows there. And, and one of the shows we do is Jay and Silent Bob Get Old. And it was Muse. It, it, we'd, we'd been... Uh, He'd, he'd kind of he'd been had drug problems his whole life, heroin, oxycontin. He'd been clean for what we thought was six years. Turned out it was five, and he'd been lying for like the last year, and he'd fallen back into it and shit. Right, I I right while we were that. going to cop out, yeah, and so I remember that. I was like, dude, I can't do this again. So we're not friends and stuff. He eventually cleaned up uh, with the help of his lady and stuff. And so when he was about three months clean again, he started hanging out and coming around, and that was around the time of Smod Castle, and so. I was like, dude, why don't we do it? And Katie Morgan was supposed to do a show with me one night. It was her show, having sex with Katie Morgan. Her dog died. She couldn't make the trip and shit. She was real close to her dog. So we needed to fill the slot. We'd sold some tickets. And Muse was hanging out. And I said, why don't we do a show? I said, this is the beauty of the podcast. It's the talking cure. Mm-hmm. All you have to do is have something interesting to say. And you, my friend, have lived a life full of interesting exploits. Mm-hmm. He never wanted to talk about using heroin because as an actor, he's like, if people know that you boot, they don't want to hire you because that's gross and shit. Mm-hmm. I said, well, how's that fucking working out for you? <laughs> I said, why don't you name it and claim it, man? Yeah. I said, get out there. I'd written like a blog series at one point about him talking about being on dope and shit. So I said, we'll use that as a guide. We'll just get up, start talking about you being clean. And that way, more people will know and more people can keep an eye on you. Kind of yeah. like an intervention. Yeah, a and make it real. Make it, you know, you speak it, you make it real. Yes. And just sit there and chat with each other. What's easier than talking to your fucking friend? And yeah. if you're doing it in front of people, yeah, you're leaning more toward trying to be funny at the same time. But you'd probably do that with your friends anyway. Right. So, boom, that podcast is born. And that podcast becomes like a profit center for the next few years. Like, yeah. it grows from this tiny thing. I couldn't even see that one coming. We called the Jane Silent Bob Get Old, and I never realized, shit, we got millions of dollars in marketing behind right. the name Jay and Silent Bob. There right. was a movie once right. called Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back that they spent, I think it was about $20 million marketing or yeah. something. So, you know, you call something Jay and Silent Bob, it's going to attract fucking attention. We had no problem starting to take the, first it was in a 50-seater at Smod Castle. Then we took it out on the road, man. The first place I think we did it live on the stage, like in a big place, was in Orlando at the Hard Rock, I think. And Muse walked out, 1,500 fucking people welcomed him like Christ to Jerusalem. Oh. And you see it in his fucking face, yeah. the transformative power of like, oh, my God, I'm worth something. And yeah. that was always his problem. The dude yeah. was a kid from Jersey who was like going to be a roofer maybe his right. whole life and right. shit like that. And one day his friend's like, hey, let's make a fucking movie. And he mm-hmm. winds up being an actor and suddenly he's an actor for a living and shit. And, you know, and then he fucking gets law. And, and it's weird. The drugs didn't even come from you know, fucking from the Hollywood side of it came more from the personal side of life. But, you know, that he had his time and he wasn't really prepared for it. He didn't plan for it. Everything was kind of a surprise. Now he can kind of just sit there and talk about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got a shorthand after being together for a long time. And watching him come out and talk, watching him literally save his own fucking life Mm -hmm. with his fucking stories of being like, I was this, I was this, blah, blah, blah. 
it's inspiring. Not only do we make a lot of money off of it, and it's fun and shit, and we just made a cartoon movie that we're going to take out and tour, same thing, like just like the show. It's just great. I'm like, look at you, motherfucker. You mm-hmm. did it with no one's fucking help. Like, we put this man in so many rehabs. Mm-hmm. Ben Affleck paid for him. I paid for him. Fucking, like, people in Malibu, fucking the highest of the high and the lowest of the low and shit. But ultimately, he's the captain of his own ship. Mm-hmm. And it was him standing up on stage, 1,500 people being like, we're here to see you and applauding. And mm-hmm. just for him walking out mm-hmm. before he said a word, you could see he was like, oh, mm-hmm. like, this is better man yeah. like i know whatever i got off of fucking heroin or oxycontins this oh, i can get off this and so this is a dude who always had problems paying bills he'd, he'd get his money off of a movie and stuff spending on ridiculous things like toy motorcycles and whatnot but now after like touring with jay and bob get old for a better part of uh, two years at this point he bought himself a house like literally talked himself into a house he was always like I wish I could just have a house. I don't understand why I can't do it. He's like, one time he said it was so bittersweet. He goes, I wish I had what you have, man. I just want to have a wife and a kid and a house, and I can't fucking put that together. Yeah. It's like, I don't know how to do that and shit. And now he's almost there. Like, he had the wife, and, and you know, in the beginning, she was with him before Wally was clean. Right. So she didn't see the, the, you know, the fucking drug time, but then she was with him when he relapsed. He relapsed. So yeah. suddenly she was like, who the fuck? It was like yeah. Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. And then so she kept invested and, and kind of saved him, brought him back and shit like that. So he had the wife, but the, having the house was such a big component of it. Yeah. He lived on people's couches. He paid rent and shit. But now he owns his own house in the Hollywood Hills. And that, that, he did that simply by sitting up there and being like, one time I did this, one time I did this. And doing it in an entertaining fashion. Yeah. But he talked himself into stability and a future. That, that's the power of podcasting. That's why when I go out on a stage, if I'm doing a Q&A or sitting down with the podcasting or if I'm showing a movie afterwards, people go, I want to make films. I said, look, that's great. Do it. But know this. It's like playing hockey. It's the most expensive sport on the planet. Like you can't just pick up a ball and go. Right. It requires film, stock. And yes, the de- democratization of uh, technology and media dictates that you can shoot a film on your phone and edit it on your phone and upload it to YouTube. So those costs are very low and stuff. That all being said, man, fuck, I got lost in what I was just saying. It was a great summation point. It was going to be great. That all being said, the power of podcasting. Power of podcasting. Thank you. When I stand on stage, I say, don't, if you're going to, if you want to express yourself, film is a very expensive way to do it. You really want to express yourself and do it inexpensively. You open up your laptop or your fucking smartphone. You just press record and you start talking and you talk to people you like or people you found interesting and you talk like you're the fucking star of something because we're so used to being entertained and this is the first generation where they're kind of getting it. Oh, we can be entertaining as well. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing I like to push people toward because A, that means that I'll have something to watch for the next few fucking years. It's inspiring and, and fucking it gives you a kick to see other artists take off and kind of start their journey and shit like that something good's going to come out of it but also it's just your legend grows you know what mm-hmm. i'm saying it's mm-hmm. just like you become the guy who launched a thousand ships yeah. like we did that with clerks and yeah maybe some of the ships were leaky and sank but people saw that movie and just like the way i saw slacker said i want to do that mm-hmm. now people hear the podcast mine yours whoever the fucks mark's and they go, oh, I want to do that. They'll sit there and listen for 100 episodes oh, before yeah. they suddenly go, oh, I could, oh, do, this. I could do this as yeah. well. I'm kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. And it begins, and more people are doing it, man. And then it, it, that, to me, that, that's, it's an exciting time to be alive as an artist because you're watching so many fucking people who would never have thought about art before mm-hmm. suddenly pick it up as an option. Mm-hmm. And not just as a living, but just as an outlet. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's a cool time. And that entrance and... and- and I think actually I was going to ask you about self-inflicted wounds, but I actually feel like the Southwest story was your self-inflicted wounds. It kind of was. was. I was going to say I it dovetailed perfect, into actually. self-inflicted wounds. Yeah, it was beautifully. Um, but I think that the, the, the transformative power of going through something challenging and figuring out who you are, figuring mm. out what's important to you, that experience for you, what, what you talked about was how that whole thing changed your life for the better, for the, for the positive change your life, changed totally. Jason's life. So, um, yeah, that's weird. The trickle down was Muse as well because it wouldn't have, it wouldn't, wouldn't have happened. happened. That's why I can't like bitch anymore about it. Like, I'll still take shots at him and be like, South Worst, the Nazis of the air and shit. <laughs> and, and it wasn't just me. Like, I felt vindicated when 
Remember fucking uh, one of the dudes, I think it was Billy Joe from Green Day, that yeah. fucking tossed him off of Southwest Flight because like, yeah. his pants are sagging. <laughs> and then one of the chicks from the L Word was, was kissing her kissing fucking girlfriend. girlfriend. They're like, Shit, they're gay. Get off the plane. Uh, right. So I felt like, look, this is your I fucking... I didn't pay $96 to be insulted like this. It's your grandma's airline. Yeah, she don't exactly. want to see saggy pants, no lesbians, <laughs> or fat kids. Like, it's just, you don't want to fly this airline. So I'll take it the shots, but that all being said... The, the ripple effect, the, the good that came out of it, I can't deny. Like, I, all these podcasts, like, you know, the, the fact that there are a bunch on, on, on our site, uh, at mm-hmm. Smodcast, that comes from, like, I have nothing to hide anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, I was kind of laid bare, and everybody knows I'm fat, so I'm just going to embrace it. And, and at this point, I'm going to say whatever fuck I want. And not in a shitty way of, like, you hey, everybody, I'm lose. here to fucking insult you. To lose. Not at all. Yeah. I'm here to just kind of share what's on my head and heart. Thankfully, what's on my head and heart isn't shitty, negative, and so No, sexist. it's generally positive. Yeah, it's kind of I positive. still got a picture of you fucking a flashlight, a flashlight but. Um... It's, it's a horribly. It's, imagine Jabba fucking a flashlight. <laughs> 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 and with that picture, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being on my show. That was awesome, Kevin. Thank Thanks you. for having Woo. me. Beautiful. I love how we came back to Leia again. Always. Always right. comes back to Leia.